would I would assume that everyone has like a a high school level science background, which actually is terrible. Yeah. But so, uh, but like a real high school level science background where they really didn't absorb much of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would include just about everyone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's funny. I remember all that stuff with like crystal clarity. But um, yeah, I know. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, the the um, well, there's really two reasons why we want to go to a renewable economy. One is the global warming problem. And I personally accept that that's a real man-made problem and a pretty urgent problem. But even if you don't accept that that's a problem, there's a finite amount of fossil fuels. Mm. And, you know, if you sort of take a naive perspective, naive perspective and say project fossil fuel usage from here, it might last a couple of hundred years, like at least coal, oil is a different story. But, you know, if you take into account exponential growth, you know, in the economy, uh, you know, the fact that the poorer countries are becoming richer and their energy consumption goes up, you know, China's, uh, you know, astro astronomically, China's the biggest uh, consumer of coal now. Uh, for example, I think they're burning a gigaton a year or something. Mm. <laughs> so so uh, if you take that into account, then it's really only a matter of decades before we run out. Um, I, I personally, as I said, I think, renewables are a problem uh, oh sorry the global warming is a problem but uh i don't see any appetite on the part of the world to actually do something about it what you do you mean at, i mean there's there's all sorts of uh, well, yeah, carbon no, reduction it, initiatives there's all sorts of uh, what uh, what i largely think of as basically uh, sort of hand waving type things and signaling type things agreements but you graph, you look at the graph of world CO, of CO two concentration in the atmosphere; it's just growing exponentially, mm. without end. So all this talk amounts to three fifths to five eighths of nothing, in my opinion. So mm. you know, you with politicians, as you get as I've gotten older, one thing I've learned is I watch very carefully their actions. I don't take the slightest notice of what they say. A classic example of that is China, which has committed to be zero carbon by twenty fifty, but last year they put in thirty eight gigawatts of coal-fired power stations mm. so yeah the contrast they're also production. china's also creating a huge amount of solar panels aren't they though uh yes but their their carbon emissions are, are just enormous yeah. and growing at a yeah. rapid pace so you know um you, it's really this is a part of the, one of the issues is that you've got kind of stories and you've got numbers mm -hmm. and the whole global warming thing the whole energy thing it really has to be looked at in terms of numbers yeah you know you can have a great story but unless the numbers actually add up, like you could say, well, look, we could replace oil with biofuels. Mm -hmm. It's a good story, but in fact, it doesn't actually work for various reasons. Mm. So, so one way or the other, we need to do something about uh, getting off carbon fossil fuels mm -hmm. and pretty, pretty rapidly. So my initial uh, sort of study of this was uh, uh, around the question of, can we actually do a renewable economy? Mm -hmm. an economy based on renewable energy is it possible i wasn't so worried about the transition but just is it actually pos a possible mm. thing uh, and that was more of an academic exercise just more out of interest probably dead by the time it was an issue but uh, but i think but uh, it's it's um it's an interesting question but more more recently you know i've been um, working a lot of my investments and the whole renewable question becomes is very important in terms mm. of the world of investments. Now, actually, before we keep going here, yeah. um, can you can you just kind of explain your background? Yeah, sure. So my background is uh, I did uh, originally I was enrolled in arts law and I did uh, a degree in pure maths and law. So I did about a third of a law degree, uh, but I didn't like law. I was going to go into law school the following year. So I switched to computers. Mm -hmm. So I became a computer programmer. And I worked in kind of system administration, uh, performance churning, uh, and then I gradually moved across into um, sort of modeling the performance of applications. And so, okay, so the designers would say, here's what we're planning to do. And I would say, well, here's how much it's going to cost to run and here's how, how it will perform. And then I got more and more into sort of proactively designing things. Um, and yeah so that was most of my career was sort of building these sort of models and then later on i did models of like okay we want to do this thing this project and i would sort of try and create a model of what it would take to actually deliver this uh, mm. thing and you've actually 
One of the reasons why I got you on is well, because yeah. I've just seen your work in a, you made a coronavirus model. Yeah. Uh, that's apparently, I haven't actually looked at it, but it's on GitHub, right? Yeah, a GitLab, yeah. Oh, GitLab, yeah. And it, it's yeah. it's done pretty well in terms of breaking. Yeah, I think, it, you know, it, it actually did manage to produce most of the kind of stylized facts about coronavirus. You know, why, for example, Taiwan at least initially, initially was able to control the thing without doing a lockdown, for example. Mm. And uh, you it, yeah. you had that story about how you, uh, can you tell the story of the, the prostate cancer model that you, you made? Um, yeah, well, uh, so I have prostate cancer. I've had it for um, just over five years. I've been diagnosed just over five years ago. And uh, the, I had one biopsy where there were two positive spots. And then the second biopsy, there were three positive spots. And I said to the urologist, oh, that's what I would expect from my model. But I did a model, a sort of statistical model of uh, the biopsies, which are basically a sampling process. And he said, oh, you can do that. And he wanted, to, he tried to persuade one of his graduate students to do a paper with me about it. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, medicine is an area where there is a really a lack of that kind of model thinking. Mm. You know, it's all, all linear regressions, p-values, uh, and even in endocrinology where they're trying to deal with the endocrine system, which is a non-linear feedback system. It's all based on ranges and, uh, you know, linear regressions and so forth. So, um, yeah, it's, it, um, and you see uh, with, um, one of the things you can capture in them, even simple models is these kind of second order effects, mm. uh, which are, you know, often very, uh, very, very important in lots of real world um, uh, uh, phenomena. So um, what is a second order effect? Well, basically, um, I, I can only think of a slightly politically incorrect answer, which is go for it. Uh, for example, um, uh, it, well, it's, uh, in um, in the 19, early 1970s, uh, the Gough Whitlam brought in the single mother supporting parent benefit, and similar measures were brought in in the US as well. And this was immediately followed, and the, with the idea of reducing poverty. Mm. In other words, single mothers tend to you know struggle, uh, so we'll give them money, and then they'll be less poor. But what happened was there was an almost immediate, uh, more than tripling of the number of um, single mother births because it provided an incentive for, uh, say, a 16 year old girl thinking, gee, I can get $180 a fortnight or whatever. Oh. That sounds like a lot of money. So <laughs> you had this explosion. And so you actually had more poverty. And that's a second order effect. Yeah. You often see this in government policies where they, they do something and uh, only think about the first order effects and not the you know the flow on and which are, which are often far more important than the than the direct effects and you i think I, i've seen a lot of economists who seem to they have all these models and all these equations that kind of assume that people act rationally and with their best interests at heart uh yeah um it's it's funny um in finance the they are quite sophisticated in, in many ways but often they typically only use linear regressions hmm. so they're not really treating the the economy as a non-linear feedback uh, mechanism mm. uh, and uh, I know the uh, my brother's actually an economist and he's always complaining the Reserve Bank in their models assume that the economy will revert back to equilibrium and full employment within three to four years that's an assumption baked into their model so they sort of say well if we do something like have bring in more workers from overseas it won't affect uh, unemployment within you know within three to four years but that's actually an assumption that's built into their model mm. and so of course if the model assumes something then the model will deliver that that result and therefore it doesn't really really prove anything i mean rationality is a good sort of zero thought assumption uh for human behavior but it doesn't really work in a lot of areas in finance in particular in asset markets mm. uh, um, and there are limits to the ability of rational people to actually uh, arbitrage away mispricings mm. you know you see you get these financial bubbles that just get beyond all, all, all levels of sanity and and this uh, this happens quite often because there's no um, uh, uh, I was just reading a paper the other day where they um, they were trying to model how do people form their opinions about say the stock market or Bitcoin mm. or housing prices or whatever and they people basically go on the last six to twelve months price trend mm. And uh, so 
and people expect that trend to in, uh, to continue to infinity. But you, I mean, in reality, the sort of momentum effects die out after about three months. So, so you know, in certain specific areas in finance or in in economics, people are not not rational. Mm. Yes, that's true. Um, and they also, of course, people have trouble controlling their desires. Uh, they have a short-term focus. They, you know, a lot of people are very limited in their ability to complex, uh, to understand complexity. Uh, and I'd say probably less than five percent of the population really are aware of this issue of second-order effects, for example. Mm. Um, uh, another example of failure to comprehend sort of non-linear models is is actually going back to coronavirus, where. Uh, you've seen some studies that say basically saying wearing masks doesn't work or lockdowns don't work and so on. And um, when you're dealing with a pandemic that grows exponentially, you you basically have two outcomes from your set of measures. Either you reduce the infectivity below one or it stays above one. So in other words, if it's above one, then each person infects more than one person and so it'll explode. If it's less than one, it'll die out. So if you do something like have a mask mandate and it takes the infectivity from 1.3 to 1.2, ultimately it really will have no effect. It'll just slow things down slightly. So mm. if someone does a study and say wearing masks doesn't have any effect, but you've you've got to look at the non-linear nature of the phenomenon and say, well, yes, it could have an it would have an effect as part of a suite of measures, as in Taiwan, where if you can get the infectivity down below one, then it'll it'll have an effect. But in general, people think in completely linear terms. Mm. So uh, yes, there, um, and and there, I mean, there, to be fair though, there you know, in economics there is a quite a literature around bounded rationality and so forth. You know, the people have limited information. The people have limited uh, computational ability. Mm. Uh, there is a literature around that, but it just gets ignored all the time. You know, Alan Greenspan's famous comment after the two thousand was an crash that it had really shaken his view of the world because he thought that firms would rationally manage risk mm. yeah. and, and of course they didn't because they assumed that the fed had their back and that if there was a crash that they would be bailed out which most of them were and there's this other um hmm. well i mean you you just mentioned short term uh gain yeah. before and i was just thinking yeah. of politicians like I think one of the one of the major problems we were talking about climate change before is that yeah. a lot of politicians seem to only think in four year cycles, like uh, making a declaration that we're going to uh, lower carbon emissions by 2050. Uh, but in actual fact, all they're doing is kind of trying to get themselves reelected or trying to trying to booster their reputation rather than actually implementing long-term changes, which would be painful initially and then uh, better in the, in, the, it, it, in the future. It's a funny thing because everyone feels they're hostage to the system. I mean, politicians feel they have to play a short-term game because if they don't win the next election, they're out. And and so, you know, to a, uh, to a large extent that they may not want to do that, but they don't often have much choice. It's a bit like corporations where they live and die by their quarterly results. Mm. And so they are forced into this kind of short-termism because if they don't, um, if they don't deliver, the fund managers will take money in the short term. The fund managers will take money away from their company. You know, their share price will tank. You know, the share. You know, then they'll be kicked out. So, um, you know, often, you know, what I'm saying is that often these people are not autonomous. And we, I think, to a large extent, we get the politicians we deserve. Mm. You know, most people think very short term uh, as well. Uh, and you know, but and it is very easy. But I, I just it's sort of bizarre the way the nationals are so upset about if Scott Morrison came out and said I commit to be carbon neutral by 2050, it wouldn't mean anything. No, it'd be absolutely it's a cheap thing to say. It'd be free. It'd sound good, and yet, you know, like China, you 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 just can in the short term do the exact opposite, and uh, you know, sort of have you have your cake and eat it too. So I, you know, I, I, I was involved in politics at one stage, and I have a lot of sympathy for the, how difficult life is for politicians. Mm. And it's only the really exceptional ones who are just absolute geniuses. Um, you know, again, both in business and in politics, who can 
manage the short term and the long term. You know, Bill Clinton was a really exceptional uh, mind, in my opinion. Mm. And then, you know, when I was at NAB, working at NAB, the bank, um, you know, Nobby Clark was like that, the CEO, and to a certain extent, Don Argus as well. They were able to deliver short term results, but at the same time, work for the long term future. Mm. But that's very difficult. So generally, most CEOs are between a sort of rock and a hard place. It's yeah. not an easy job. That's why it's rewarded so highly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, and uh, that's uh, that's right. And it's uh, you know, and I saw that. Like I thought when I you know went from I was in the public sector, and then I went to I had very left wing views when I was young, and and I, I went to NAB, and I thought, oh, you know, Nobby Clark is like a typical CEO, but he was uh, actually <laughs> uh, quite exceptional. Yeah. And then we had uh, Don Argus, who was also very you know he went on and, and turned BHP into a global powerhouse. And then, um, then we had Frank Shakuta, who wasn't quite, uh, in my humble opinion, quite of the same calibre. Um, so uh, yes, it is because you have to get so many things right. Mm. And it's like in politics, you can be good at ten things, and if you're bad at one thing, uh, yeah, your history. So, mm. uh, uh, and and the public is very impatient. Yeah, it's difficult. Yeah, well, a good CEO also needs to know how to delegate. I think. If they're not good at the one thing, they really need to make up for it in some way. Yeah, well, I, there was a good book by Jack Welch, uh, Winning, where he talks about how he managed GE. And he was very successful. And he said, like, picking his next level down was the most important job. Mm. But even with people like that, who are at the sort of executive general manager type level, he said he had to constantly follow up. He said he mm. spent 70% of his time following people up to make sure they did what they said they were going to do. Mm. You know, so even at that level, uh, you know, just to, you know, you'd think it was someone at that level, if they said they would do something that you could take it for granted, but no, he just no. had to constantly follow up um, and, and make thing, make sure things um, things actually happen. We're all human yep. and it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit scary to realize that the politicians and the giant CEOs that run corporations that are influencing our every moves are just humans and need to follow up on people and need to, and make mistakes. And, you know, I think of, I mean, we were, I kind of got you going to talk about this climate change thing because I think it's really important, but yeah. I've just come to this realization on a very deep level that all the politicians that are making these huge, broad sweeping changes are just traumatized children on the inside who are trying their best to, to get by. Mm. Well, they, in a book I read recently or parts of um, about attachment disorders and um, the, makes the point that 30 to 40 percent of the population have don't even have secure attachment. In other words, they, as, as young children, they were not felt protect. They did not feel protected and loved and nurtured. Mm. Uh, and you know, these even these basic things. So you know, there is a couple of it's thirty to forty percent of the population. That's a that's a lot of, sort of walking wounded uh, out there. Mm. Uh, yes, yes. Um, and um, I'm just trying to think. Um, No, I've lost the thought. Okay. So, um, yeah. One of the main things is that you you just have this really interesting idea, this twist on climate change that I don't. So, what I usually hear from from greenies and people who know about the environment is like, we need to be one hundred percent renewable. We need to uh, get renewables on as as much as possible, and we need to just get rid of coal, like ban all these all the coal mines. Uh, we don't need any of these power stations, and what you've told me in the past is that it's not quite that easy. No, well, to give a classic example, um, I mean, the big issue is the, to, to convert to a renewable economy, for one thing will require a vast expenditure of energy. Mm. You know, the um, uh, uh, Volkswagen, which is one of the leaders in uh, electric vehicles in Europe, put out a note uh, recently pointing out that electric vehicles are actually worse from the point of view of CO2 emissions than petrol cars up to the first 120,000 kilometers. And that's assuming the electricity they use to fill their batteries is mm. totally uh, green. Mm. Just because the phenomenal amount of metal goes into an electric vehicle, 30 kilograms of copper, there's a lot more steel, there's lithium, there's cobalt, you know, nickel, um, graphite, all these things. And cobalt uh, is often mined in, in like the Congo, right? Is that? Yeah, I mean, mining. Mining is. Um, I've been reading quite a few reports by you know by mining companies, and mining is incredibly hard. Yeah. Dealing with 
you know, you've got a mine in the Congo or somewhere where, you know, the government may not be totally uncorrupt. <laughs> yeah, that's an understatement. <laughs> Yeah, you know, a lot of these lithium mines are out in the jungle in um, South America. Using slaves, using slaves got, and, and yeah. blackmailing people and you've got children, no, all sorts of stuff. You've got no, you can't just plug your coal mine into the local electricity grid because there is no local electricity grid. Mm. You've got to basically, you know, blaze some sort of track into the jungle and then, you know, take a, a, a diesel generator in there. Mm. That's how you get your power by smashing the Amazon rainforest. That's how we get our electric cars. <laughs> and, you know, so the, 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 the uh, this is one thing that people don't realize. They just think lithium, you know, lithium batteries will just magically appear out of nothingness. <laughs> but just to give an example, copper, I was reading Oz Minerals recent report and they were saying their next generation of mines, which will be in, you know, five or 10 years, they're taking copper out of the ground at a grade of 0.36%. So you you dig up a ton of, of rock, crush it, apply various chemicals to it, and you get three and a bit kilos of copper out of wow. it. Wow! And a car, electric car, takes about thirty kilos of copper alone. So that's thirty tons of rock that you. And you know, if you've ever dug a hole in your backyard, you know how much energy it takes to dig dig stuff. Mm. So, uh, so the the um, the energy cost and and you know and applying this in a capital sense across the whole um, across the whole economy is just absolutely enormous. Mm. Uh, but you know that's the transition cost. But then you've got the uh, the steady state. So uh, just to sort of maybe back uh, step a bit, uh, I mentioned about how we've got two problems that will drive a renewable economy, which is is the global warming and running out of fossil fuels. Mm. And then I would say there's sort of four challenges with the renewable economy, which is uh, intermittency, low density, uh, the four impossibles, and the fact that batteries suck. So perhaps I could go through those. Yep. So the intermittency, you know, the sun doesn't shine at night. If you look at a photo of the earth, there's a lot of cloud out there. So mm. there's no real useful sun when there's cloud. Especially in places like England. I mean, it's cloudy nine months of the year. That's right. And, you know, people have done the calculation within, if you covered England with solar panels, you still wouldn't have enough energy. Yeah. Basically. Uh, so, so, uh, and it's worse, you know, I remember going to Europe in my honeymoon, I spent eight weeks north of the Pyrenees and I didn't see the sun the whole time. Uh, and then, uh, so, but even when, it, even in Australia, like it's been cloudy here for four or five days, yeah. we've had little bits of sunshine. Uh, wind is also very intermittent. Uh, so what that drives is because you have this intermittency, you need much more redundancy and you need storage. So, you know, a typical calculation would suggest, you know, if you need X amount of watts for solar from your solar panels, you need four lots of solar panels for geographically dispersed. Mm. And with wind, probably you don't need as much, probably two times redundancy. Whereas with coal-fired power stations, you probably need fifteen percent redundancy. Could you small. explain? Could you explain the uh, the solar panels again? How you need four solar panels for what exactly? So you want to get X amount of energy. Yeah. Theoretically, if what you had one solar panel that was in the sun all the time. Yeah. Uh, but the th thing is, that solar panel will not be in the sun all the time. Yeah. So you need like to have four solar panels in distributed locations in the hope that most of the time at least one of them will have sun shining on Oh, okay, I see, yeah. And similarly with wind, it might be windy on the east coast but not on the west coast or, you know, sometimes mm. it can be too windy, whatever. So you need this redundancy to cater for the, uh, to compensate for the intermittency. And of course, if you have redundancy, it has to be de geographically distributed. It's nice having two solar panels next to each other because they'll be probably both under the same cloud. Mm -hmm. And because they're geographically distributed, you need to have cables to connect all these geographically distributed solar panels mm. to the grid. And the cables are also made out of copper, right? Copper! And yeah. <laughs> they have plastic linings and they are on steel towers yeah. and they have concrete foundations, all of which are very CO2 intensive. So the the it sort of brings up the point that you need to look at the total system costs rather than just saying, well, you know, a solar panel is cheap. Mm. It's, that's only a tiny fraction of the cost. 
So that's the basically the outline of the problem of intermittency. Well, especially in a country like Australia, I mean, we're so spread out. Like, if you wanted to have solar a solar panel grid that connected Brisbane and and Sydney, for example, I mean, that's a tw that's an eight hour drive, a ten hour drive. That's a it's massive. That's right. I think they're talking about uh, putting in a new interconnect between South Australia and Victoria, and I think it's several billion dollars. Yeah. So this is not like just plugging into a power point in your house. This is major infrastructure. Mm. And people don't like having these huge transmission wires all over the place. They're very unpopular. Mm. You know, you know, people approve of renewable energy in principle, but they don't want something like that, um, you know, going through their farm or, you know, by their village or whatever. Yeah. So that's an intermittency, which is a big problem. Whereas if you look at, say, nuclear, coal, or whatever, they, are, they, are, they don't have this problem of intermittency. Hydro does have a problem of intermittency in the sense that you can easily run out of water. Mm. And you have to manage, well, you use the water for multiple things, you know, for irrigation as well as power. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, solar and wind are the best renewables, uh, which we'll get probably get to later. Then you've got the issue of low density. So if you think about, say, a coal-fired power station and the associated coal mine, you're probably talking about... Um, energy density of, you know, multiple tens of kilowatts per square meter. Mm. Whereas with, with um, solar, over a year, you might get 30 watts, 30 watts per square meter. With wind, you might get 10 watts in, in net mm. terms. You know, you've got night time, like in theory, there's a thousand watts coming in on per square meter, but that's across, you know, on the profile to the Earth's surface. There's four times as much surface area in the earth as the profile. So you divide by four. Then you've got night time, you know, you've got night time, you've got cloud, you've got this, that, and the other thing. You've got dust on the things. Uh, you can only get actually a 50% efficiency or 55% even in theory. So you add all this up and you end up, you, you're doing pretty well if you get 30 watts out of a solar panel across mm. the whole year. Mm. And how uh, many watts does it take to run an average household? Well, the average person in a Western country, you know, in a sort of middle class person would be responsible for about 15,000 watts. So the average solar panel gives you 30 watts and the average 30, person takes right. up so 15,000. Yeah. Um, now, and of course, uh, I didn't. Uh, yeah, so you've got this problem of low density that you basically need. I think the a person would need about sort of 600 square meters or so of solar panels per mm -hmm. person when you do the thing of the redundancy and everything, mm. uh, you know, which is, a, which is a lot. Um, and just to sort of build that many 600 solar panels per person across the whole world is a huge exercise, just in terms of the amount of energy it's required to do that capital investment. Mm. Uh, okay. So, uh, wind is about, is less, a lower density, about 10 Watts, but of course wind towers can be shared with other things. You, know, you can put wind in a field and you can grow stuff in the field or whatever. Um, so wind is lower density uh, again than solar. And then you've got others which are just tiny, you know, biofuels, you might get one watt per square meter out of your farmland. Um, geothermal, the, the flux of uh, energy from the Earth's core is about a tenth of a watt per square meter. So, you know, drops. Uh, uh, now, there are hot spots, but they're finite. Mm. You know, there. Uh, you know, and once you've taken that energy out, it it will take thousands of years to replenish. Okay. And even um. Uh, you know, even uh, uh, hydroelectric is basically maxed out. Every basically hydroelectric opportunity has been taken, and the dams are silting up. About ten percent of the hydroelectric capacity is lost to silting already, and the dams have to be replaced every so often. Huge concrete dams. Okay, so that's uh, lack of density, and the lack of density also applies to the, my fourth point, which is batteries. Just to give you an idea, um, the lithium-ion battery in your laptop has an energy density of roughly one sixtieth of the energy density of petrol. What is energy density? In other words, how many how many uh, joules per kilogram? How many joules per kilogram? So how much energy can store up and in a kilo? Yeah, how much yep. energy can store okay. in the battery. And um, so this is one reason why um, it's going to be very difficult to do um, hmm. to do uh, battery powered aircraft. Because so I should run my, my laptop on petrol. It's probably more efficient. I should run a, my laptop on petrol instead. <laughs> 
Well, there have been various attempts to use, you know, like fuel cells or whatever, but of course it's very difficult to take such a thing onto an aircraft. <laughs> you uh, might not want to put it in, a, in an enclosed room. I no, there is actually a limit to the size of a battery you're allowed to take on an aircraft as well. Mm. <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, so the, there's an, a density issue with batteries. And of course, if you put batteries in an aircraft, as opposed to petrol, you know, if you, if you fill a, an aircraft up with, you know, aircraft fuel or whatever, aviation fuel, basically petrol, um, as the fuel tanks are depleted, the plane gets lighter. But batteries don't get lighter as they get depleted. So it's actually worse than it looks. You know, when fully loaded, 60 times, but across the whole trip, it would be more like 100 times lower density for batteries than compared to, um, you know, to an oil-based fuel. So the low density issue applies to batteries as well. Um, so when a plane's flying, they yeah. take into account that the plane will be lighter halfway through and that they need yeah. to use less petrol halfway yeah, yeah. through. Okay, yeah. That's right. I mean, it, they, they do get much lighter. And it's mm -hmm. a sort of trade-off. If you don't want to put too much fuel in the plane because it will take more energy to fly, on the other hand, you don't want to have too little in case you run out. Mm. So they have to do that sort of balancing act. Um, yeah, so uh, that's uh, uh, batteries. And, you know, the, so it really is a big problem. Uh, in, with batteries because uh, batteries were invented about 130 years ago. Uh, they've got better at about 7% per annum since then. That is to say the best batteries have got 7% better. If you mm -hmm. look at any given battery technology, it has improved at a more rapid rate. So if you look at say lithium ion batteries from the first sort of experimental curiosities to now, they've increased, improved at a rapid rate. For, but for much, most of that period, they were completely uncompetitive, so it's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And the most rapid improvements were before it became competitive with, say, NICAD batteries or lead acid batteries. Seven percent a year, though. That's doubling every every eight years or something. Yeah, like but that. they were they were they started off from a very low base. Whereas with computers, you know, it's like. Uh, 50. But if there's if batteries are still doubling every every ten years or or eight years or whatever it is, then don't we aren't we just going to get great batteries in the next? 20 well, years you take, you take say if you're doubling every 10 years and you have to go up by a factor of 60 to be competitive oh before. yeah that's true it's mm. it's it's a while of, and that assumes that increase it keeps going mm. you know uh, there's been a lot of you know brilliant minds have worked on the problem and it, it's not a problem that's going to go away quickly mm. in the next 10 years or so um Okay, so and then you've got the the uh, the four impossibles. So you've got, as I mentioned, air travel is a big issue. Now people have put together aircraft that like will hold four people, and they don't take their suitcases with them, and then none of them are that overweight, and they can go lot short haul travel. So you can sort of do that kind of thing with batteries. Mm -hmm. But you know, fully laden seven forty seven with uh, you know six hundred people on board, forget it. You know, but mm -hmm. the basic the batteries. If you're flying from Australia to Dubai or whatever, halfway to London, you're going to be um, Basically, all the weight is taken by batteries, and there's no room for cargo or people. <laughs> that sounds well. interesting, though. I would like to take a, a personal flight. Like, if you have some luggage with you, and you take, you have like one or two people on a flight, and then you would take your suitcase with you, and it would be like Uber, but for planes, and it would all be renewable. That sounds like a pretty cool future. Yeah, um, it's just it just doesn't scale up to. Um, as I said, it can be done, but it's very expensive. You yeah. know, it's more a private jet kind of type scenario yeah. than, um, than um, you know, mass commercial transportation, you know, $1,200 to fly to London kind of thing. Mm. Um, so, so batteries, and then you get onto the impossibles. So you've got, I uh, mentioned air transport is really not a solved problem with, with the current technology for renewables. Mm. Uh, and you've got um, shipping, heavy transport, there's some possibility of some routes could be run with electric trains, mm. but in general, heavy transport is all over the place. Uh, and then you've got concrete and concrete manufacture. You basically heat limestone and it expels this carbon dioxide, mm. but it emits carbon dioxide that way. And then steel manufacture. There are some ideas of how to manufacture steel without uh, producing vast amounts of carbon dioxide. You basically, to make steel, you sort of mix uh, iron oxide with Coking coal and heat it up, and uh, the oxygen is, is expelled, and you end mm. up with um, uh, with steel. Uh, so that produces a lot of carbon dioxide. And there are theories of how you could possibly do it. 
so those things are very difficult to do with batteries. You know, you might think ships could run on batteries because they're just floating, but in fact, the heavier the ship, the more lower it sits in the sea and the more drag you get. Yeah, they take hun so, hundreds um, of tons of cargo, thousands. Of course they would drag down. That's right. But, you know, if you have heavy batteries, mm. you uh, you basically need more energy. So you get into a sort of... Mm. So it cycle. sounds like one of the biggest problems here is that batteries aren't good enough with renewables. That's what's really right. stopping if you, could, if you could come up with a battery... That's that's exactly right. If you could come up with a battery that was twenty times better than the lithium ion battery and that didn't use scarce materials and take a lot of energy to produce, a lot of the problem would be solved, but although not completely. Um I think I, I did a sort of simulation based on that and you still have capacity issues just in terms of the ability to soak enough uh, uh, energy out of the out of the sunlight. Just in terms if if you made the assumption that, say, the living standards would continue to go up by 2% a year, the Earth's population continues to grow to 12 billion, and the poorer countries got to middle class levels. If all those things happened, it's still quite difficult, even with good batteries. Mm. But ba batteries are definitely the biggest bottleneck at the moment. So, this is where uh, the poor batteries, this is. Uh, um, this is where uh, I think the turning the carbon dioxide into oil or something like oil mm. has a role to play. Uh, and it's not, um, batteries are, uh, are useful in a number of ways. One thing, if you say, we, we, look, we talked about uh, England before, you think about England, well, they could, they, you could say, well, look, what we do is we'll put solar panels in, say, Libya in the desert and then we'll just have cables going up to England and we can solve the problem there. But then you've got the problem that we've got some guy in Libya with his hand on the power plug, on the plug saying, well, you know, you do what we want or I will cut off the power instantly. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the, the sort of the <laughs> geopolitical vulnerabilities involved in that, you've already had issues with Rada, Russia cutting off oil, um, gas pipelines and so on. Mm. And it's really, you know, that. So, so you've got that vulnerability and, you know, Creating those huge cable networks is very expensive as well. Shipping oil from one place to another is very cheap. Mm. So if you make oil from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you can then ship energy around at will. You know, we could make oil in the desert in Australia and then ship it to the rest of the world. So we could be a leading oil producer. So why aren't we but doing that? We could have stockpiles. Well, it's a, a function of price. Um, the, uh, I think there is also political opposition the federal government appears to oppose anything like that. So so um, the process of, of, just so I understand, the process of making oil, where we would do that because batteries are inefficient and so we're taking carbon dioxide from the air and then compressing it using energy, obviously, and machinery into yeah. petrol or oil, which is way more efficient. And then we could suddenly store the energy in a, in a smaller container and send it off and use it for ships and planes and things like that. Yes. So um, what you effectively do is you use a, a process to take the carbon dioxide out of the air. Mm. You basically run the carbon dioxide, the air through a labyrinth, which contains some material that attracts carbon dioxide. And then after this material becomes saturated, you then cut off the air supply and then you heat the thing up and that liberates the carbon dioxide and, mix, and it pushes out a, a carbon dioxide rich mix. So you've taken the carbon dioxide out of the air that way. Now, then the question arises of what do you do with the carbon dioxide? There's a kind of what I think is a fanciful notion of sequestering it under the ground. Um, I just don't think there's enough capacity to do that. And there are various downsides. Carbon dioxide is very poisonous. So if it escaped, it would kill lots of people. Mm. Um, and it has to be uh, stored for sort of geological time periods. So there's a, there's a number of issues with directly storing the carbon dioxide. So what you uh, effectively do is you've got carbon dioxide, which contains carbon. The other element you need to make oil is hydrogen, which is handily enough in water. Dihydrogen monoxide is water. So you take water, you uh, use electrolysis to separate out the hydrogen. Now you've got hydrogen plus carbon dioxide. You heat that up and you end up with there's also all sorts of pathways, but you end up with carbon monoxide plus hydrogen, then you do the same process, similar process again, and you end up with methane. And then you can polymerize the methane to produce uh, higher hydrocarbons. 
methane being a gas, natural gas, and then you've got, you know, depending on the number of carbon atoms in the chain, through to petrol is fairly, you know, ethane, and octane, which is kind of like petrol, and then higher, longer chains, which are, are more oil, and then through to sort of bitumen or whatever. Is this something you could theoretically do in your mom's basement? I mean, or do you need really crazy equipment for this? Well, you basically need two things, energy and a catalyst. Uh, it's basically a chemistry process or, a, you know, a petrochemical plant type operation. Mm. And these things generally operate much more efficiently at scale. Uh, but it is something that can and has been done. So I, I don't understand. Why don't we have giant petrol cor companies making this already? I well, mean, they're making know, it out of air. Well, the, um, the basically the problem is the cost. You need, as I said, the catalysts. You need to build the big plants and you need to put in a phenomenal amount of energy. So as mm -hmm. I, I don't know if I mentioned, but, uh, you know, a litre of petrol has something like, uh, you know, 30 megajoules of mm -hmm. energy. So you've got to supply at least that. Okay. You've got to effectively undo the burning of the petrol, which produces carbon dioxide and water. Mm -hmm. You have to provide the energy to reverse that. But in fact, it's a lot worse than that. You know, in my researching in this, there seems to be this kind of engineering rule of four, which basically says if something theoretically takes X amount of resources in engineering reality, it's four times that at least. Yeah. As an example, you know, the lead acid battery in your car has four times as much lead as theoretically it needs to store the amount of power it has. Mm. Uh, so that, that does apply across the board. So you're probably going to have to suffice, you know, something like uh, 120 megajoules of energy per litre. So you need vast amounts of energy. Mm. And um, as I said, you need, if you want to do it at scale, you need to build a big petrochemical type plant. And we're going to need a lot of them. And also you need because the carbon dot you need to extract the CO2 out of the air, that consumes about a tenth of the energy involved, but it's non-trivial. To get, um, you know, the carbon dioxide is only 0.04% of the air, so you need to process millions of cubic metres of air to get even a reasonable amount of carbon dioxide. So it, it's a function of price. I think it would probably be via about 200 to $250 a barrel of oil, something like that. Mm. At the moment, uh, oil's about uh, 70 US dollars a barrel. Yeah. Uh, so it's technically possible, but expensive. So, but of course you wouldn't need to provide all your energy in the form of oil. It would just be these specific things, shipping, air transport. Um, and also you would use this process to cancel the CO2 released by the steel making and the concrete making. But it would cost energy to make the petrol. So now, isn't that a self-defeating cycle? Now, this is one neat thing. Like, it does all sound like a very sad story. But when you look at the uh, solar grid that I described before, where you've got this four times redundancy and two times redundancy on the wind, you're actually going to be producing a lot of surplus energy, hmm. which has nowhere to go. Why because is that? If well, we had a grid, you can't store it because, it, well, it, if, if, you, if you produce more energy than the grid needs at that moment, yeah. it's, it's, it, unless you store it, it's wasted. So you have to sort of turn off the turbines or, you know, whatever. So, so it's that capacity, you know, you have to build massive overcapacity to avoid uh, hiatuses where there's no energy produced or not enough energy produced. But it means on average, you're going to be over producing mm. or have them so there is that and you can't really store it economically just to give you an example elon musk 100 million dollar battery in south australia stores less than a minute of australia's totally in total energy consumption so storage is very expensive mm. and even the pumped hydro if you if you did say um, 10 snowy mountain schemes worth of pumped hydro up and down the Great Dividing Range, you could possibly store about as much as, much as one day worth of worth of uh, Australia's energy consumption. Wow! One day, but that's about as far as you can push it. So you know the, the, the and that's the most sort of cost-effective form of uh, batteries. So you really can't store it uh, beyond a few days at the most. So you've got this surplus energy, and you could actually use that surplus energy to make. Mm -hmm 
oil, right? So that's a um, that's a good thing. That's a benefit. And now there is a kind of downside to that in the sense that you're going to have these petrochemical plants that are going to be idle some of the time. Like these things are obviously most efficient if they're run uh, 24 by 7 by 365. Mm -hmm. But if they're running on sort of surplus energy, some of the time they're going to have to be turned off. And there's a, you know, there's a sort of cool down period and a warm up period. So you can't just turn them on and off, you know, like a TV set. So, so it's not completely free. It would mean you'd have to have over capacity in terms of the sort of petrochemical plant capacity. I mean, you can, um, you know, you could get over the day and night cycle with batteries probably, but there will be some uh, resultant need for excess capacity. But the good news is basically the energy would be free. Hmm. So roughly, I think something like 10 to 15% of the total energy would have to be converted to petrol or oil or some hydrocarbon. So overall, that would result in roughly a doubling of the total amount of energy that you would be using. But that should be probably be able to be accommodated within the, the bounds of this sort of surplus energy. Hmm. And uh, we, we want to build out the plants next to the solar farms, I would assume because then you yes. wouldn't have to transport it. They would, they would need access to water, but you can use seawater. Mm. Um, uh, in fact, it's better in a way because of being, uh, having the salt in it, it conducts electricity and so it can be electrolyzed. Mm. So uh, you use the seawater to get the hydrogen. And again, that can be run off, um, you know, off the, off the surplus energy. So, uh, yeah, so you basically make all this oil and, and you're taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, which we're going to have to do. We've reached, the, we've gone beyond the point where we can just sort of cut emissions and that will be enough. Mm. We have to actually start taking the CO2 out of the atmosphere. So we take it out and we recycle it, make oil out of it and lo and behold, green oil. And, you know, as I said, it would probably be, you're probably looking at about 200 to $250 a barrel as a sort of point where this would become uh, economical. But these things tend to lower in cost over time as people get better and more efficient. Well, I'm assuming a reasonably efficient process already. Mm. You know, uh, it, the, so initially it's going to cost two thousand dollars a barrel. Well, I, I, you know, I think initially you would have to kind of subsidise it, or yeah. you know, you'd have mandates, or um, you know, you have a carbon price, and then that gives people incentive to take carbon out of the atmosphere, for example. Yeah. You know, if you have a carbon price of, um, I think the Treasury estimated the carbon price of like three hundred dollars a ton or something mm. would get us down to where we need to be. So if you had that sort of carbon price, and you're taking carbon out of the atmosphere, that would be, um, you know, pay for a lot of it. But, you know, a lot of it comes down to just sort of pricing the externality of CO two emissions, which we're not doing at the moment. What do you mean by like, that? Well, you know, if you, you know, if you burn coal and emit CO2 into the atmosphere, there's a harm to other people and other people in the future in particular, but you're not paying anyone as compensation for that harm. Mm. It's a, just a, like a classic example of pollution. You know, if you have a factory and it pollutes things and makes a neighborhood uninhabitable, that's an externality. It's a cost that you're creating, but you're not bearing that cost. And really it's a cost that should be taken into account in terms of whether that factory should happen or whether that factory should be there. So that's in, in economic terms, that's what an externality is, is a cost that you are inflicting on someone else in an economic activity, but you are not paying that cost. Mm. So, um, you know, the, the externalities take, take many form, but forms, but pollution is the sort of obvious one. Um, yeah, so so if if we had a carbon price and just said like anyone who emits co2 pays this price anyone who takes co2 out of the atmosphere will they get a subsidy then um, that would uh, that would go a long way because obviously anyone who burned petrol would have to pay this the uh, carbon tax or anyone who burned coal or whatever so that it would be a way we could um, uh, make the incentives happen and the other thing is as I mentioned, in you know, in a matter of decades, we're just going to be out of oil and coal, mm. and um, in that situation, we will have no oil or coal to take out. I and mean, if we want to have these fuels, where the, there's really very few alternatives in terms of how you generate them, you could either go with biofuels, and perhaps I should say something about biofuels. I mentioned before that the energy 
yield from biofuels is maybe one joule per square metre. So bearing in mind that the average person uses about 15,000, so one watt per square metre, I beg your pardon. The average person is burning about 15,000 watts. So, and the other problem with biofuels is there's not a whole lot of farmland around to be, that's virgin and not used and can be used for, to make biofuels. What you know is bio, biofuels. How do you make biofuels? Well, you do something like you grow corn or sugar cane and yeah. then you ferment it. So um, why do you need virgin land? Why can't we, I mean, America has thousands of cornfields. Right, that's right. But that corn is used as food. So what I'm trying to say is that if you start using vast amounts of land as to make biofuels, where are you going to get your fuel from? I mean, so America could produce oh. all, the, all the oil. We'll get rid of some high fructose corn syrup. <laughs> I think that's a good trade off. Well, America, so America could produce almost enough oil for its needs, but it would not be able to produce any food. Oh, okay. It would take more than all of its farmlands. Mm. And, it, you know, um, you know, you could say, well, America could import a fuel, but like worldwide, it's just not an answer. Yeah, no. It's just not the, you know, you work out <clears throat> one watt per square meter for biofuels, you multiply that by the number of people, mm. or by the, you know, it just doesn't, um, yeah. it just doesn't pan out. So, so, you know, you could use, you know, rich people could perhaps afford to pay biofuels, but they're really squeezing someone out of the ability to have food. Mm. And, and you're seeing this uh, already uh, in the US where they have these um, subsidies for ethanol and it has resulted in increasing in fuel f food prices in the US mm. because people are diverting uh, corn, etc., cetera, to, um, and other grains. You know, farmland is pretty fungible. You know, you can grow corn or wheat or whatever, uh, but uh, people are, you know, have been diverting corn into making ethanol and that increase, reduced the amount of land that's available to grow, grow food. Mm. So, you know, that, uh, you know, the, all, as, that's what I was saying, all the farmland is basically spoken for. Mm. If you want to make biofuels, you have to stop using farmland for something else. So that's, that's really the biggest, um, biggest challenge. Whereas, you know, with um, taking the CO2 out of the air, yes, you need metal and stuff and you need catalysts, you need energy, but you can do it more or less in the desert. And like, there may be rare species or whatever in the desert, but you're not actually causing people to starve. Yeah. You're not yeah. taking away from the food supply. I feel like Australia things. would be perfect for that. We have so much space. I think it could be quite an opportunity. So just to um, sort of summarize. So if you look at the income structure of the world as it is, according to my calculations, you could do a renewable economy just. Wow. You could do it. There would be enormous transition costs. Mm. As I said, you know, think about replacing all the cars with electric cars, you know, um, lots, you know, 10 snowy mountain schemes to store the pumped hydro for, to store a day supply, blah, blah, blah. lots of batteries. Uh, so it could be done. But if you uh, then say, OK, what we're going to do, we're going to get the whole world up to Western middle class living standards. We're going to uh, allow 2% growth in uh, income GDP per capita. And we're going to bear in mind that the fact that the world's population is growing, mm -hmm. I just, it just does not look in the slightest bit. Uh, well, right. it might not work in our current situation. I mean, but we could, for instance, develop better batteries. We could develop more efficient technology. And so like my laptop takes a lot of power right now, but what if my laptop took one fifth the amount of power in the future? Yeah, I mean, the com computation is a lot less efficient than the theoretical minimum. Uh, you know, there's a theoretical limit to how efficient computation can be mm. from the point of view of thermodynamics. We're a long way from that. Um, but there is a sort of trade-off with speed and efficiency. Um, the, the big problem is that our most of our technology really relies on cheap energy. Mm. Uh, you look at basically, and, and um, you know, people often say, well, you know, we can have a high living standard without consuming a lot of energy, but the correlation between energy consumption and living standards is just incredibly tight. Mm. You know, you think of anything you want to do that reflects a higher living standard, go on a holiday, have a nice house, have air conditioning, you know, um, travel, you, know, you name it. Um, everything basically requires energy. Yeah, airplanes are a huge use of energy. I mean, it's, if we, if we reduce the, if we reduce our flights, I think we'd, we'd make a, a rather large impact just by that alone. Yeah. 
and, and to, st to stabilise the, um, the climate, we, you know, we need to reduce the CO2 emissions by about 98%. Mm. And so if you think that, you know, four-fifths of the world's population are poor, you know, then to, sort of per middle class, and if we're going to take them up to our living standard, you're really talking about high 99% reduction in carbon. Mm. But, um, they, they, you know, it, it just does seem um, unavoidable that a high living standard requires lots of uh, energy or even, you know, just having nice food, refrigeration, heating, you know, just, you know, having avocados year round, or, you know, ev all the nice things, films, you know, ev ev everything takes, everything nice really generally takes a lot of energy. Mm. So that's, that's the, um, uh, the dilemma, but even with good batteries, just the sort of energy absorption capacity becomes an issue when you bring the whole world up to first world living standards. Mm. Um, even if you had good batteries, you, you know, if you look at, the, you know, say China, how much solar arrays they would need to give them 15,000 watts, it's, it would cover a third of China. Um, and so that, that's a that's a big um, that's a big problem. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah. So my tentative conclusion: I'm still looking into the whole question of what is the exact economics of the mm. uh, carbon dioxide into oil. Uh, but uh, it, it just does appear that we can't get the whole world up to first world living standards with the population we have. Um, with uh, renewable energy. I mean, the only real out would be if someone could make fusion energy work. Because, mm. you know, that is a complete different ball game. And now a lot of people have um, various ideas about things that would solve the problem. So often biofuels are mentioned. Uh, people often mention we could cut our energy consumption without cutting our living standards. There's that idea of putting a ring around the sun and redirecting all the sun's rays into the one spot using mirrors, right? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I mean, the sun produces a ph phenomenal amount of energy, but at the moment, no one's really worked out cheap ways to get stuff into space and to redirect the energy down yeah. to us. Um, you know, in, in th like, you know, create a Dyson sphere and capture all the energy of the sun, it would be just unbelievable. But we don't really know how to do that at this stage. Um, Another um, thing that often comes up is um, nuclear energy. Hmm. And the problem is that the uranium is quite a rare element, especially U-235, which is only 1% of the uranium. And that's really what is useful as fuel. And so the uranium is really quite a finite, limited resource, just the way hydrocarbons are. Yeah, we probably just don't want to go from one non-renewable to another non-renewable, though. It, yeah, just, it doesn't and, seem like a long-term solution. Yeah, and, and you know, and of course, um, as I mentioned before, like hydro is not really a renewable, it's a finite resource. The dams mm. will silt up and they'll be useless. Mm. So you've got that, um, that problem. Now you could, uh, so I mentioned fusion as a possible out, but the problem is we don't have a sun and the beauty of the sun is because of the immense mag um, gravitational field, the the hydrogen in the sun is very dense, and that makes it much easier for the fusion reactions to happen. We have to achieve a similar result with incredibly high temperatures. What is fusion? So fusion is basically you take uh, four hydrogen atoms and turn it into helium. Mm -hmm. So two of the protons. Uh, so a hydrogen atom consists of a proton and some elect an electron. So four hydrogen atoms will give you four protons. The four protons, two of the protons can turn into neutrons. So you end up with two protons and two neutrons, and that's the nucleus of the helium atom. Know, it turns out that the mass is less than the mass of the hydrogen that it came from. Wow. And that mass, by Einstein's famous formula of E equals mc squared, gives you energy. I didn't know you could have Incredible. trans protons. That's amazing. Yeah, so um, a um, more or less a, a proton plus a neutron, sorry, a proton plus an electron plus a bit of energy and stuff more or less gives you a neutron kind of thing. Um, it's a bit com more complicated than that, but that's the basic idea. So you, so early on in the periodic table, the mass falls and the bottom is lead. 
the lowest mass per nucleon is lead. And then as you go up further up in the periodic table towards like uranium and things, the mass goes up for complicated reasons. So that's why you can take U-235 and it'll split into two smaller nuclei and it will release energy because you're sort of going down the incline. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you take light elements, you fuse them together and you end up with less mass per nucleon, per proton or neutron. And so you're freeing uh, energy that way. Mm. Uh, but people, you know, there's the old joke that, um, that uh, nuclear fusion is 50 years away, as it always has been <laughs> and as it always will be. <laughs> it's very complex. And every so often it sort of comes up and people claim things or they've achieved break even for 2.3 seconds or something. Or I heard a recent claim 100 seconds or something. But that's technical break even. That's not economic break even. Mm. So, um, but that would change uh, it, it change the game if you got fusion going. Now, with with fission, as I said, you take uranium-235 and you split the atom using neutrons and then it releases energy by splitting into two smaller um, nuclei. Now, the problem is you've got all this U-238, which is more or less useless. And that's why you have to concentrate the U-235 in these centrifuges you might've heard about. So, <clears throat> but what you can do is you can create these breeder reactors, which, and you pump the neutrons into the U-238 and then it breaks down into other atoms, plutonium in particular, which are then highly radioactive and can be then used to produce energy. Mm. The only problem being that you can then, if you have a breeder reactor, you can easily make the materials to make nuclear bombs. So Ooh. if you want to put breeder reactors around the world, the, the, the issue of nuclear proliferation becomes a huge problem. Yeah. It uh, does seem like when technology gets better, we just keep uh, finding new and new ways to kill ourselves and to make it more accessible to everyone. Like, in the 80s, kids didn't just have access to the knowledge of how to make a bomb. But now it's just on the internet. Like, you can just find it. Uh, yes. Um, I don't know. It's... Um, I think one of the issues is that, I think Peter Turchin wrote a book about this, that basically any civilization will expand its energy use to, to use up all the energy that's available mm. in a good year. So if anything goes wrong, it's basically overcommitted and becomes unstable. You know, when you're dealing with one person, if you say your income falls, like as mine did when I retired, I can adjust my lifestyle or whatever. But as a society, it's much more complicated to deal with a, a decline in energy input and uh, and they often do tend to collapse and you've seen this so many times hmm. so uh, so we we have basically you know uh, taken our energy use to the point of where we use burning up all the oil we're burning up all the carbon we're burning uh, uranium using up the uranium 235 and now we what are we going to do if the energy available is less it's going to be very fraught hmm. um, yeah so uh, you know, um, you know, I, I really think as a society, we should be putting a lot more money into fusion research. And and you've also got other things, like you could actually do things like, you know, depopulation. Mm. You encourage people to have fewer children. Well, that's what the vaccine's for. <laughs> Did you hear everyone who gets the vaccine is going to die in three years? Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. Do you, have you heard about like, uh, they call it shedding or like sp spike protein shedding i think i don't really know what it is i've i just i'd just like to say my name is tim josling and i do not endorse this theory. <laughs> <laughs> you want to get banned from youtube <laughs> um, yeah uh is that okay. do you know is that real the shedding uh look i mean they obviously the vaccines were rushed into production into use and i think there are some issues uh, the um, there are some sort of strange new side effects that have people, some people have experienced. Mm. But also, you know, um, I think I had COVID early on, and I have certainly seen strange uh, effects from COVID. Mm. Uh, you know, where my body just changed in per seemingly permanently in ways that were very surprising. Mm. So it's not like the vaccine. You know, you for me, you need to make a 
you've got a choice of vaccine. Really, I think you either have to get the vaccine or you'll get COVID at some point. Yeah. So that's the trade-off. It's not like vaccine or nothing. And that's according to your model, right? Well, yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, more or less everyone gets chickenpox at some point or everyone mm. gets the cold or everyone gets whatever, the flu, that's if you don't have the shots. So, um, and, you know, the whole idea of herd immunity is kind of a bit of an over, much of an oversimplification. It's not like when you reach some magic level of herd immunity that the disease will just go away. It just mm. means that you'll get flare ups, but they won't really go very far. Mm. And if you've got, say, a town like, say, I'm just randomly guessing here, that Nimbin, for example, where no one gets vaccinated, <laughs> yeah, then you could still have quite a outbreak there. You know, some of them be... mean to; they just never make it to their appointments. <laughs> Sorry. Some of them mean to; they just never make it to their appointments. <laughs> so, uh, so even if you have herd immunity, uh, you know, herd immunity is it really doesn't just apply at a national or global level it has to apply at a local level as well so if you've got and it doesn't mean you can't have cases yeah. and you know over time over 50 years you know everyone will basically get mopped up i suspect unless they can really wipe it out yeah which i see no signs you know it looks like in most countries the the percentage of people who are getting vaccinated is is sort of topping out you know maybe 50 60 percent i think you so you know because people are making the judgment well you know, it's not that likely that I'll get it, you know, and I, you know, maybe I'll just rely on the rest of the communities, herd immunity and hope for the best sort of thing. I don't know if I'm in the, if I'm in the majority or not, but I, I personally am just waiting a few years to see what all the side effects are. I'll probably get it in a year or two, but uh, I'll let the guinea pigs go first. Yeah, uh, I would just say that you should, uh, um, you know, try and balance up the risks of actually getting the disease. Yeah, because there's long-term heart damage, even for young people too. You know, and you know, there's um, there's receptors, the ACE um, receptor in the ovaries, in the testes, mm. in the heart, um, in the eyes. So there's a potential for all sorts of long-term um, long-term damage from getting COVID. Mm. Um, so I, to me, it was. You know, when you look at the incidence of serious side effects from the vaccine, it was far less than from getting the disease. Mm. You know, with, with the disease at my age of 66, you, you know, you might have a 3% chance of dying. Yeah. Uh, versus a 1 in 100,000 chance of getting the blood clotting. Mm. Not really that close. But yeah. Um, and you know, the, obviously, the more people don't get vaccinated, the more likely it is that you would get the disease. Mm. Uh, you know, the SARS one got wiped out, MERS got wiped out, so it is possible it'll get wiped out. But it, it does seem to have gotten uh, entrenched, and we now have all these variants that are so much more infectious um, that uh, it. You know, I think the government will make a decision at some point that we're going to open up the borders, and if you haven't had the vaccine, then that's on you. Yeah, um, yeah, it, probably. It, it'd be very difficult for people who have compromised immune systems, etc. You know, if I ended up having chemotherapy for my cancer or whatever, I, it would place me in a very vulnerable position. Mm. Um, yeah, so I'm not, sure think about. not sure how we got onto that, but um, ah. yeah, that's um, I think that's really the equation with renewables. I mean, the other thing is that with renewables, everyone sort of has their pet theory, which they think is the magic solution. I mentioned mm. some of them, you know, biofuels, uranium, um, or whatever. Um, and uh, the the other big fallacy is that people, you need to look at the whole system and how do you put together a whole system of energy that satisfies all the needs for energy mm. to use, um, not just electricity. And people say, well, look, you know, how can you say people use 15,000, 15 kilowatts? My electricity bill was blah. But that doesn't take into account the energy used to build your house or to build yeah. your car or run your car the hospital you go to, or, you know, all the other parts of society. And most countries, Western countries, 20% of their energy actually comes in the form of imported goods. Mm. So in China, they burn coal or whatever and, and manufacture things, and then we import them here. But that is still responsible for CO2. And if you don't have a car, you still eat food, which gives you the energy to propel your car. And oftentimes that meat comes from overseas well, or from Queensland or whatever. Well, that's right. So the Green Revolution was really all about putting more energy into uh, food cultivation and mm. improving yields. You know, fertilizers are incredibly energy intensive. Mm. 
Mm. I mean, that's why they make bombs out of fertilizer. It's so oh. energy intensive. Mm. You know, like you, you, you can't just go and buy a ton of uh, fertilizer. You have to mm. satisfy, you know, um, the authorities that you're a bona fide farmer and blah, 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 and what you're going to use it for, etc. So because people make, um, make bombs out of fertilizer. Mm. So fertilizer, and of course, and especially in Australia, the energy involved in um, just ploughing fields is enormous. Mm. You know, when we had the farm, I used to drive the tractor, it was a huge beast. You know, it used to use a humongous amount, a 300 litre pet tank, Mm. that you'd fill up every day. So the, the, the energy involved in producing food is enormous. Uh, yeah. So what I'd like to know is, uh, have you told any politicians about your your idea of the the petrol conversion idea? I mean, do you, have you told any, have you talked to any companies? Uh, like, I uh, feel like Shell or BP would be the right people to, to receive this information. Well, there uh, there is a company that is trying to do this, Prometheus Incorporated in the US. Mm. They they are a startup, and uh, I found out of them because someone said, "Oh, like this is a solved problem." Prometheus is doing it, and I went and looked at their website, and they're in the very early stages. Mm. And there's been re some research done in um, in uh, in uh, Melbourne on this. Uh, issue of um, you know getting the carbon away from the oxygen in carbon dioxide there's research and it goes back a long way of course you know in world war ii germany made oil from coal mm. which is you know kind of part of the process so all the bits are known but it's it's sort of moot until the price gets up to you know 200 250 dollars a barrel mm. um, the, the big risk with the whole renewable uh, conversion which i haven't really alluded to is we kind of have lots of energy now with which we could actually make the transition. But if we wait till all the fossil fuels is gone, gone then we won't have the energy to yeah. make the transition. Yeah. So we could be in a situation, you know, it's like saying, oh, I wish I'd saved money when I had a job. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's like you're unemployed and you don't have any money and yeah. it's too late. So we'd, we could find ourselves very quickly, you know, certainly by the end of the century, in that situation where there's just nothing uh, you know i don't think um, but the, the other thing is i just find the whole thing very unpleasant because of the ideological overlay of the mm. whole question you know, yeah it seems like the the right wingers i listen to almost still deny climate change somehow and then the uh the left wingers are all you know renewables are the only solution and it's it's kind of a very like um they have one solution and one rule, and it's just this one word that's renewables. They're not really thinking about what goes on behind it and the complexity of it all. That's right. And when you talk about, well, actually, you know, your electric car and talk about, you know, where does that carbon come from and how mm. do you get it? Um, and they sort of, well, you know, you're not on the right team. You know, I suppose you're supposed <laughs> to be a good guy or something. I'm on Team Human. I want us to live. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, that's one thing, as I mentioned, like I started off as a, this is an exercise in idle curiosity more than anything. Um, and then um, uh, it turned into like, I'm trying to understand how the world works and what's going to actually happen. Mm. Because, you know, as an investor, you, your beliefs have to pay rent. You know, if you believe false things, you, um, you lose money. Yep. Now, uh, but for most people in the social world, your beliefs don't have to pay rent. You can say, look, I'm all for renewables. You know, I have the recycled bags in my SUV or blah, blah, blah. Which also costs energy to make. Better. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Yeah. I could be are... worse than this, the thing. Um, yeah. I mean, know. unless you use them 10,000 times or something, which you're not, you're not, you're not, you're using them a hundred times. And then, so, you know, for most people, these beliefs are really just forms of social signaling or whatever, and they don't have to actually be true. Mm. And they don't really care if they're true in many cases, I don't think they're just a way of, you know, saying sort of popular things, mm. but I, I, I am keen to, um, to understand, um, what, you know, what really is going to go on and, you know, and I, I like, you know, I think, um, all this sort of triumphalism about renewable energy and what's happened is governments are making it very hard to open coal mines or to, you know, explore for oil or whatever. And I think this is just going to be an explosion in the price of coal and oil mm. uh, because it's, they're just so ne uh, uh, inescapably necessary. Mm. So I think, uh, you know, and, and we're seeing this, you know, coal and oil, coal's at a 10 year, 11 year high, mm. oil's, um, you know, going through the roof. Uh, and 
So we're going, we're going to, I think, see, you know, an increasing crunch on these essential things because no one's sort of trying to think clearly about what is the transition. Mm -hmm. And there's just this sort of Pollyanna view that renewables are so cheap, you, you know, it's like we used to be here about in nuclear energy, it'd be so cheap they won't even bother to meter it, you know. Mm. But no, um, and, you know, in fact, when you look at, you do a sort of graph of percentage renewables in the electricity supply of a given country and the cost of electricity, it's a very strong positive relationship. In other words, the more renewables, the more expensive the electricity is. Mm. And that occurs even if you correct for GDP. So it's not just a rich person's uh, syndrome. So, so um, I don't think renewables are actually cheap. And I think that, you know, that ultimately they're going, it's going to be, because if they were cheap, they would just, as you, I think you suggested, if they were cheap, there would be just this automatic movement to them. Mm. We need to put in a carbon price to create the incentives uh, to enable the transition. And the sooner the transition can occur, the better, because we may not, we may run out of time, I think, to, to make the um, transition if we leave it too, too much longer. So, you know, I'm a big fan of Elon Musk. He's really pushing it Yeah. to try and, you know, and like, Full credit to him to, you know, he's really having a go, you know, he's not just building some dot com website or whatever, it's, you know, um, Facebook or whatever. He's actually trying to build stuff that actually will make a difference. But it is Yeah, really that's cool. that's what uh I really like that attitude. I, I think the uh the left seems to have this attitude of like, oh, we all need to work together and recycle our bottles and, and do all this stuff and it's like I, I just I don't really have time for the attitude that says we need to make sure every single human being does the right thing because I just don't think it's going to work. If you, I would much rather put my time and effort into promoting like Elon Musk's initiatives, which is, you know, it's kind of one guy who's leading this entire charge to change the way we consume in the first place. Or like Boyan Slot with the uh, the ocean cleanup project. I mean, wow. he's not he's not telling everyone he's not holding a sign out there and saying stop throwing bottles in the ocean. He's just cleaning them up himself. That, that's right. And the way he started OpenAI, like everyone's sort of upset about you know the risk of um, hyper intelligent uh, mm. artificial intelligence, you know, ruining the universe and filling it with paper clips or whatever. I think it's a real risk. But he's actually doing something about it, mm. like doing research. So uh, good for him. But it's. Um, if they tr the trouble is, uh, is we really need to get the incentives in place. It's why such, it was such a shame the Greens voted against the carbon tax. Mm. Um, because, you know, if you get the incentives, then the capitalists will be run, you know, falling over themselves to actually solve the problem. Yeah. You just yeah. need to put the right incentives uh, incentives in place. And, and the incentives, and also having the right incentives and the right price structures just guides people's behaviour automatically. Mm. Whereas... It's so easy and you see so many people fall for this thing of, you know, doing some sort of tokenistic thing and thinking they're making a difference. And, you know, as they say, you know, if you do a hundred things that don't make the slightest difference, you're not going to make the slightest difference, mm. you know, and recycling your bottles, you know, may, it may actually not make any difference at no, all. No, because there, there are also trucks that come and collect the bottles that use up energy and then the plants recycling yeah. use up energy. Like there's arguments that it doesn't even do anything. Yeah, and in many cases, these these measures are counted. Like, say, biofuels. Arguably, biofuels actually are an energy sink. Mm. They actually consume more energy than they than they produce. And you know, I remember going to East Germany on my honeymoon, going through Checkpoint Parley, Charlie into East Berlin, and uh, East Germany had the most advanced so recycling program in Europe. Wow! And also the worst pollution, <laughs> uh, because the recycling program was actually a drain. Yeah. So, you, you know, uh, but, you know, the, the wonders of capitalism. That's, that's capitalism, some real Russian shit. <laughs> the, the one, one of the wonders of capitalism is if you put the right incentives in place, as I said, businessmen yeah. will be falling over each other to solve the problem. Not to mention, uh, there, there are a lot of unexplored territories for carbon sequestration, like moss, for instance. Uh, it's, so moss, um, certain types will, uh, you know, a few meters of moss will, will capture the amount of carbon that... Uh, multiple acres of, of trees ca uh, capture. And so you, you could theoretically um, just have a giant moss wall like on, on every building. And then theoretically you could just keep capturing carbon from it. Now the problem is that moss is very difficult to grow, it's slow. But I just think if you had, if you had an incentive to grow it, like if you were giving people carbon credits and then you could just CRISPR edit some moss. Not that I know anything about this, 
See, you don't have you don't have to work out the solution. That's the thing. Is you say like the price of carbon is going to be thirty yeah. dollars, and every year it's going to go up by ten dollars a ton yeah. until it hits three hundred dollars a ton. Trust me, people will find solutions. Yeah. yeah, you don't have to come up. And but the moment the government and this is like the conservative government is much as much an offender as anyone. They're trying to micromanage the solution by doing things like mandating ethanol or whatever. Mm. And you know, it's really just a subsidy for the sugar growers in Queensland, mm. as far as I can tell. You know, the, the history has shown governments are just terrible at micromanaging things. But if they can create the right incentives yeah. and unleash the creative energy of people, um, lots of things can happen. Now, I don't know if the moss thing, you've got to bear in mind, yeah. we're putting yeah. out like 30 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide. That's a lot of moss. Mm. And how long will the moss last before it decomposes? Because we've yeah. got to store this for a long time. So, um, you know, even, even um, in terms of ca taking uh, carbon dioxide out of the air, even the most optimised algae in lab conditions, you know, you're still only getting, um, uh, you know, capturing a few percent of the sun's energy in terms of pulling that carbon dioxide out, mm -hmm. out of the atmosphere or, you know, using that energy to do that. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think we should be prescriptive about the solutions, but I think yeah. we should just put strong, strong incentives in place and then, uh, and then let people solve the actual problem. Mm. That, that, that's, um, that's my opinion, because you know, because you can come with all these stories that sound very plausible, but do they actually work? You know, you can say, well, look, lithium batteries are much better than they used to be, but they used to be absolutely pathetically hopeless, and now they're just terrible. You know, <laughs> so but you know, they're they're as I said, they're a long way from from the energy density of petrol. So it's very very easy to get sort of caught up in these stories, and that's why you've got to you've yeah. really got to work it, work out the numbers. You know, so you see the same thing with um, investing. You know, we had back in the late 90s and also last year, we had a lot of these sort of story stocks or meme stocks or whatever, and they have a story. And, but when you look at the companies, they just, it just doesn't, there's just no way it could possibly work. Yeah. There's no way these some, these companies could be, possibly be a good investment. You don't think AMC has potential? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't looked at AMC in detail, but uh, I've looked at a few of these. Um, I think we have a difference of opinion on Palantir, but. You know, these Palantir is selling at like 400 times revenue or something. Yeah, yeah. Like, okay. So let's say they can make a profit margin of 25% of revenue ultimately. So they're selling at like, what's that for? Yeah. 1,200 times their possible earnings. Like, yeah, they're, they're a long way north. You know, like that. there has to be a phenomenal amount of growth. To, you know, that's the kind of arithmetic I'm yeah. talking about. Like, okay, you yeah. can say, okay, I can see how Palantir could increase its revenue by a factor of 300 right mm -hmm. okay but that you've got to you know you do the calculation and say okay well how can they increase their revenue by 300 fold yeah and you know companies have done that you know microsoft did that or whatever with the pc exposure you know but um <coughs> that it's very um it's very easy to get sort of sucked up in these these sort of stories particularly when all your friends are sitting around nodding and thinking what a great person you are because you have the right opinions or, or whatever. But, um, you know, because um, it's funny, the other thing that people often say to me is, well, Tim, look, this is all well and good, but what's the answer? And my response to that is it doesn't actually have to be an answer. Mm. You know, I can tell you what civilizations do is they collapse, you know, Samaria, Babylon, the yeah. ancient Israel kingdoms, Greece, Rome, the Ottoman Empire. That's what they do. They also they save themselves them. from the brink of extinction, though. That right? happens to. They also save themselves from the brink of extinction. That happens too. Sometimes, yes, yes. What I'm saying though is, it's not inevitable. We'll find an answer. It's not. It's not. But I think there, there's this problem with telling people that there's a solution and then leaving it. And that problem is that they have this frustration that builds up and they don't have anywhere to go. If you say. Um, we need to put more money in batteries, for instance, then at least they can donate yeah. money to, you know, a cause that's helping this or, you know, something, well, they can do yeah. something. And of course, um, the, the big, uh, as I said, the, the, the most important thing they can do is, is, is bring in a carbon price that is yeah. meaningful. Vote, and, yeah, and vote for a carbon. The carbon price is going to go up to $300 a ton or whatever that it yeah. needs to be. And then all sorts of energy will be unleashed to solving yeah. the problem. Yeah. And, and the, the economy will find the most efficient ways to economize on carbon. 
And we can do it. We have the resources. Like, I, I just know so many geniuses who are sitting in finance right now, like, making numbers go up. And they're not really doing that much for the world. And if they kind of just, if this was a real problem, and if companies started paying to, uh, you know, deal with this carbon issue, they would just move from one boat to the other. Well, that's right. There's no money in it. But if there was suddenly there was a lot of money in it. Yeah. Um, you know, it, you know, it's like, why did I go into computers? One reason was because it paid like three times as much as any other job that I could stand. Yep. You know? um, I could, I, you know, I could have finished law and gone into law, but I didn't want to do that. Mm. So, you know, the, and, you know, people respond to incentives. So, you know, if there was a vast amount of money, um, you can be sure the brain power would move in that direction. Mm. Just like there's so much money being made in finance. Mm -hmm. there's so many people have made billions in finance so that's where smart people go mm. um yeah uh, uh, but apart from that the government could be very helpful in terms of like funding more of the fundamental research around fusion around uh, battery technology as you mentioned uh conversion extraction and, and conversion of carbon dioxide but a lot of it's um hindered by the way there's, there's this sort of ideological dimension to this problem now that you know your position is assessed on a sort of ideological purity basis by one side or the other. Yeah. Um, so. Um, but you know, I know I just I know a lot of people who don't think like that as well. I mean, uh, I'm kind of just trying to be very compassionate towards anyone who's still in that in that headspace. And then, like I, I just I talk to tons of smart people who are just kind of in the center and have different views in different places. Like I think we're kind of a lot of the intelligentsia I think are moving towards. Um, maybe more centrist point of view, or at least understanding the other side. Well, yeah, and I think, uh, you know, a lot of, to be honest, a lot of smart people posturing as being of some political uh, persuasion, but they're not actually, they have a much more nuanced view. And even when I was in pol involved in politics, talking to, you know, federal ministers and things one-on-one, -on -one, and you would get a completely different story. Oh, and liars, people, good. Uh, sorry? <laughs> oh, liars, fantastic. Completely different. Um, you know, much more nuanced, balanced view of things. But then, you know, they're trying to manage reality, but they're also trying to get re-elected next time. So, you know, it's, 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 um, it is a challenge. But, you know, governments really need to get... And, but there's no incentives at the moment. Um, there's a kind of perverse incentives around... Uh, there's a sort of fashion for this ESG investing, environmentally, socially, and govern governance-oriented investing. But it's kind of very symbolic in many ways mm. uh, you know so you're getting certain things are regarded as good like so now that we realize that copper is used in electric cars copper mining is good you know kind of thing <laughs> whereas before it was you know it was terrible uh so um I, you know it, it just you know, the whole idea of the economy as a huge calculating machine, you put the incentives in and you get the outcome, mm. uh, is very powerful because the you have, you know, the, the sort of capitalist economy transmits information in the form of prices as to what's scarce and what's needed and what's valuable. Uh, and it also gives people incentive to respond to that information. Mm. No, it's not perfect. I mean, there are all sorts of things that can go wrong. But, you know, you can, you can use that can leverage that uh, the power of that uh, to enormous effect and as I said it's such a pity that the Greens um, voted against the carbon tax and I think they I, I, I sort of went and re researched like why did they do that and the thing with the objection was that it were they were using the capitalist system to solve the problem and they objected to that you know by having a carbon tax you create the signal to the uh, economy to solve the problem and they didn't want that they wanted a government directed solution oh inefficient that seems okay to been there that's the problem the government doesn't fix problems very well like that they the government is just inefficiency after inefficiency if you want a problem solved you have to create an incentive for for corporations to do it i think that's right so you but as you know sort of like in machine learning where you have a kind of value function you say well here's what we value yeah here's what you know we don't value carbon dioxide going to the air, and so we'll uh, bring in a tax on that, and people will find a way of not doing that, mm. or doing it less, or taking it out of the air, or whatever. So, uh, where, whereas um, you know, governments, uh, government decision making is so um, constructed. I mean, I've run into this problem myself recently, where there was a problem of stray dogs, and 
you know, last time I bought a dog was probably something like 20 years ago. And dogs were really cheap. But now the government solved the problem of stray dogs by making it really incredibly expensive to breed dogs. Mm. You know, if you have a dog that's not de-sexed, you have to pay like $300 a year registration fee. Wow. Um, you know, if you want to become a registered breed, you know, want to breed dogs, you have to become a registered breeder and do this and the other thing and have an OHS plan and blah, 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 blah. And so, like, you look on uh, Gumtree and, like, you want to buy a Jack Russell, that'll be $2,500. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm still getting over the sort of stuff. I mean, maybe if you get like a seven-year-old dog where someone's moving into a nursing home, you know, and they can't keep the dog, they might get it. You have it for five hundred dollars. Sort of thing. <laughs> so it's a bit, um, it's a bit, uh, bit um, uh, disappointing. So you know, the government solutions are obviously very, often very ham-fisted, ignore second-order effects, ignore all the costs. Uh, you know, whereas in an economy, people will take into account all the costs. You know, they'll say, well, look, it can cost me X amount to put carbon in the air, but on the other hand, we really need to do this thing. Mm. Um, the, the other thing, um, uh, just getting back to the issue of um, the uh, uh, correlation between affluence and energy consumption, it's just, I saw this amazing figure that Bill Gates put out over 1,600 tonnes of carbon dioxide in 2019. Now, the average person puts out about 10 tonnes. Mm -hmm. Wow. Now, uh, and this is basically from just from his use of private jets. Now, he since has decided he will buy carbon credits to negate his use of private jets. Mm -hmm. I think carbon credits are a bit of a sort of scam, really. Uh, you know, that, you know, he's still flying around in private jets spewing out 1,600 tonnes of you know, and like, okay, you get buy carbon credits, which basically, you know, you buy a farm and you plant a forest on it or whatever. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. But, and so it's soaking up CO2. But on the other hand, someone can't now use that farmland to grow food. Mm. So, you know. Like, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, we need, we need, far, we need uh, wildlife too and nature and all that good stuff. That's true. But, you know, a large percentage of the world's population, you know, has trouble affording enough land yeah like quality food uh yeah so um you know and the, a lot of these environment concert conferences uh, i think there was one at davos where they um you could not get a park for your private jet <laughs> there were so many private jets living and you know notoriously cheap but you know prince charles or you know whatever flying around the world in private jets and lecturing the rest of us yeah uh, we buy electric cars or whatever um so uh yeah one rule for the rich and one for the poor oh yeah uh, yeah, so um, it, it's, um, but, you know, governments that, you know, people go into politics because they want power, and, you know, and just, you know, set, uh, like creating a carbon price and then just letting the market solve the problem is not really an exercise of power. Mm. Um, you know, where they would much rather do things like mandate ethanol so their mates in the sugar industry in Queensland can make more money, or this, that, and the other thing. Um, so, um, but, you know, you end up with the solutions that are often worse than the, um, the problem they meant to uh, uh, to solve. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I'm um, sort of following on from this. I'm even going to do some more research into this whole question of how do you make oil. Uh, one of the issues is that it's it's highly proprietary. A lot of this stuff. There's I think about ten plants making oil out of usually out of coal or something around the world. South Africa did it because they had an oil embargo, and they have a plant. And the Germans were doing it for, uh, oil from coal in World War II. Uh, but they're, they're really not keen to sort of share their secrets of how they do it and how much it costs. Mm. Most of the companies are private companies. So uh, it, you, you can't sort of go and inspect their books. So it can be quite a challenge. And of course, it's something that we don't really have much expertise on in Australia in terms of petrochemical um, uh, technology. Mm. Uh, it might be a bit of a challenge. Uh, but yeah, if the government would uh, put, you know, they should be putting tens of billions or hundreds of billions into um, fusion research. There's, there's no obvious reason why it's not possible. Um, uh, but as you, I think as you suggested earlier on, um, it's not a problem that's going to occur before the end of the three year election cycle. All they need to do is posture sufficiently to get enough votes. Yeah, seems and, like it.
and you see, you know, you see, um, I mean, at least the kind of conservatives are pretty consistent in their approach, whereas with Labor speaks out of both sides of its mouth in the sense that they go to a coal mining community and talk about how the coal is the future and blah, blah, blah. And then they go to sort of Balmain or whatever in the city. And, uh, the, you know, they're all for the green things. So, you know, what do they actually believe? I don't know. They believe in getting re-elected. I think that's that's about it. I The thing about politicians is that I just, I, I just have this... Uh, I guess it's kind of a spiritual thing, but I, I just really don't like lying. And I think, and it, it kind of really rubs me the wrong way every time someone lies. And so me, but also I think a lot of people, I'm, I'm just kind of checked out of politics. Like I just can't, I don't want to spend time figuring out what's what's real and what's not. And the entire nature of politics is essentially to say things that you don't believe because your constituency believes it, which is, I, I just don't, I don't think I have the stomach for it at all. Yeah, and it's a terribly disillusioning process you go through when you're young because you sort of believe what politicians tell you, particularly if they're telling you what you want to hear, which, they, you know, is often the case. And so you're listening and saying, yeah, 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 oh, at last someone's saying this, da, 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 and they're just pandering to you in most cases. Mm. Um, so it's it's very disillusioning. But, you know, by my age, I, it doesn't even occur to me that they would be telling the truth. <laughs> All it means is that they just want you to believe that thing. Yeah. Um, and and um, so that's why, as I said before, you just observe their actions. Mm. And just reverse engineer their beliefs from their actions. Who's your favorite politician? Australian <laughs> or not? Favorite. <laughs> Do you have one? If you don't have one, that's also fine. Uh, <laughs> well, um, I did, uh, like as I said, I, I think Bill Clinton was a very capable person. Mm. Um, so I mean, I agree his uh, his twenty six rides on Epstein's jet make me <laughs> feel a little a uh, little iffy towards him now. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, look, as um, Hillary Clinton said, you know, he's a hard dog to keep on the porch. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, he was definitely um, uh, you know sort of um, uh, yes, he uh, he had a weakness for the um, the ladies. Um, yeah, yeah, so there, there's that. Um, I think, you know, as we were just talking about before, like a lot of them really do, I think, start, go in with good intentions, but they're mm -hmm. corrupted by the system. And I, I did get to know Dr. David Kemp, who was a, minerous, a member in the Liberal Party government uh, a long time ago. And I saw his transition from when he first went into Parliament to by the end, before just before he left. And, you know, he was... I think when he came in, like he's on the right, of course, but but he he really sincerely believed what he was saying, I think, and he really talked about issues in depth, at least in you know limit, you know sort of private company, whatever. Uh, but the, I you know I just saw how the system really broke him down and turned him into a, just a typical politician. Mm. So uh, I don't think it's. I don't think the key thing is the individuals. You need to look at the system. And this is like, say, H. Edward Deming, Deming's work on quality, where he says it's never a solution to blame someone for a problem. Mm. You should always look at why did the system produce that behaviour? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and of course, we have um, uh, the, um, you know, some systemic problems, but, you know, we have a very short electoral cycle in federal politics. You know, in, it's worse in America because you have uh, a two-year cycle, basically, because you have the midterm elections after two years. So you've really got a two-year cycle. So I, I think um, my favourite politician would be someone who would try and, um, and, you know, reform the system and change the change the incentives. And I don't know what the answer is. You know, particularly when I did some telephone polling at one stage, talking to the general public. And to be honest, it is an absolute miracle we have the quality of politicians that we have. When you talk to the general public, uh, they really, 95% of them have just no understanding whatsoever of the issues. No. And also are very short-term orientated and very self-orientated. Mm. What's in it for me in the short term, but in, you know, often in a suiting yourself in the foot sort of way. So we need to sort of try and create a political system which, you know, where you get this, 
the incentives right or get the structures right so that we get capable people. And I've noticed this even in my own lifetime. The politicians at the top now are just not of the same calibre that they were even 20 years ago. You know, Bob Hawke's cabinet. Mm. There's just no comparison to either of the front branches now. And and I think, you know, we have we have created bad incentives you know, we discourage really capable people from going into politics. You know, part of that is, you know, on the ALP side, it used to be that, you know, um, it was very hard for a working class boy to do good. So a clearing politics was quite appealing. Because now basically anyone can go, go to uni pretty well. You know, my, uh, my urologist, we, you know, was a poor boy from the Western suburbs. And he ends up as a professor. Mm. So, you know, those pathways are now open. Um, but I think one thing that they could possibly do is you need to reduce the cost of running campaigns. It's particularly an issue in America. It, you know, Hillary Clinton, Clinton I think, spent $1.5 billion running for president. I don't know if it's the cost of running campaigns. I think, why are we allowing... I just don't know why we're allowing oil companies to sponsor politicians. Like... Well, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. Well, I think you'll have if you if if Hillary Clinton has to raise fifteen hundred fifteen hundred million dollars. Yeah. Uh, people are going to find ways to get that money to her. Yeah. And they're going to pay. You know, there's going to be a price to pay. I think. So you know, if, if one thing would be just banning television advertising, mm. limiting the spend. Um, or, you know, and partly publicly funding campaigns. I think limiting spend is probably the best idea, right? So you're yeah, spent, you know, you have a million dollar cap or a $10 million cap and that's all you can do. Uh, that's right. And, and I think a lot, there's also a, an issue in the US, uh, but also here, of the over-democratization of the pre-selection process. Um, over-democratization. Uh, yeah, so it used to be uh, until the early 60s, that the, the candidates were chosen by the sort of, you know, um, party officials, mm. the presidential candidates. And then they uh, they opened, uh, they used to have primaries, but they were kind of advisory only. Mm. And then they made the primaries binding. And it's just become a catastrophe because the, the politicians have to appeal to the lunatic fringe in their party to get mm. through the primaries. And so that's why, you know, one reason why politics is so polarized in the US the politicians are far more polarised than the population in general because you've got people who are a member of a political party who bother to vote, who are the most extreme motivated people. You look at the people who vote in the primaries, they're really out on the lunatic yeah, fringe on both sides. So by making uh, hmm, the, the, the process so democratic, you've, you've created this polarisation. And in fact, if you had the, the political heavies picking the candidates, they will be thinking, well, how can we win the election? We don't want a, to an extreme a candidate. Mm. Um, I mean, the, I think the first example of this was McGovern in 1972. Um, George McGovern, who was extreme left winger in those days, he later went into business and changed his opinions. But um, he, um, he was trounced by Richard Nixon because he was just so far on the left. Mm. And that was because the, he was picked by the party faithful. Mm. So that would, you know, so there needs to be some kind of mechanism where, you know, the idiot vote gets somehow filtered out to a certain extent. Um, well, I mean, mandatory voting might be better. Like in Australia, we have to vote, or else you get a, you know, you get a fine in the mail. It's a couple hundred dollars or whatever. Yeah, and now you have a, a more subtle issue with the uh, the selection process in Australia, where I found that I came up against this issue in relation to euthanasia, and I was on the local board of the Voluntary Euthanasia Party at one point, and um, that all the politicians live in fear of the pre-selection committees kicking mm. them out if they don't toe the line on euthanasia, mm. particularly on the conservative side. You typically, when euthanasia laws go through, you might get zero people wow. on the conservative by vote for it. And when you talk to them privately, they're for it. Mm. But they're like, well, look, it's not my number one issue. It's not worth my job. If I vote for this legislation, I'll be out in my year because you get the fanatics get into the pre-selection boards. And um, I remember hearing an interview on the ABC with a woman who was uh, vying for pre-selection for the Senate in Tasmania on the conservative side. Mm. And she rang around to all 30 members of the pre-selection committee. And all I wanted to hear about was, 
abortion, birth control, euthanasia, you know, all these sort of um, these types of uh, right to life sort of issues, which are, you know, really, you know, if you look at, say, um, uh, euthanasia, the support is in around 80% in the community in general. Mm. But yet these pre-selection committees are full of people who have very uh, vehement views against them. Mm. You know, in the AOP, you have a similar view with the ALP right being so influenced by the Catholic Church, but that is, is really waning, I think, over time. Mm. So, so, you know, we do have this issue that, yes, you, we all vote and that's good, but you have these sort of pre-selection committees which are, are very unrepresentative and they're the ones who really pick, in most cases, the member because most seats are safe seats. So, so that's a real, um, a, a real um, challenge. I mean, I think one solution to that could be that there should be a none of the above option when you vote. How does that work? Well, say so you can either vote for candidate A, candidate B, candidate C, or none of the above. And yeah. if none of the above wins, they're all banned. Yeah. You have another election. <laughs> that's a great idea. I like that. I would have <laughs> voted none of the above at the election, the last one. You know, and that's a way for the electorate to just reject someone who's unacceptable to them. Yeah. Uh, you know, say like, let's say you're in Barnaby Joyce's electorate, yeah. which um, a friend of mine is. And um, it's interesting, he reckons Barnaby's a great guy. He's come across, you know, being next to him in the supermarket queue or whatever. Because, you know, but that's a quarter part of the skill of being a politician is yeah, to come across as a great guy. Anyway, you know, so if you don't like the local member that the, um, powers that be have uh, for, tried to foist on you, you can just say no. Yeah. I think that may be, uh, that may be a way for the public to reject uh, these, uh, these candidates. Uh, but look, it's a very intractable problem because, <coughs> excuse me, you have a sort of double problem. It's like, you want everyone to have the franchise, but on the other hand, the vast majority of the public spend very little time understanding the issues. It's dubious whether they have the capacity to understand the issues mm. and and so, I mean, also, look, I don't understand most of the issues and that's because I've, I've done the calculations. If I took all this, if I took enough time to understand every major political issue, I wouldn't like, I wouldn't have time for hobbies that I have. I mean, it's, you'd probably have to have a part-time job just dedicated to, uh, studying political issues to really understand them. It's just not worth my, and then what, what happens? And then I vote once every four years, like there's, it's not worth it to, to understand politics for me. Well, well, that's right. So I've probably spent four months full time trying to understand these issues mm. with renewables. And I spent uh, a similar amount of time understanding issues around euthanasia. Yeah. You know, how good is palliative care, for example? Because they often say, oh, palliative care solves the problem. What are you complaining about? I don't know. So, you know, I read the textbooks on palliative care, blah, blah, blah. You know, but that's just two issues. Mm. Uh, and, and, um, you know, to understand the issues of sort of management of the economy, economics, tax policy, it's huge. Uh, I mean, my number one issue uh, is um, euthanasia, you know, being having cancer, a cancer form of cancer, which often results in a hideous death. Mm. So, uh, so probably wouldn't matter much what my opinion was on other issues. I would vote based on that in any case, mm. but, um, but yeah, it's it's a challenge. Even for someone who's got plenty of time and got plenty of capacity, it's still very difficult. Mm. Uh, but you know, I would recommend that you try and get on a thing and do some telephone polling or do something where you <laughs> deal with the general public. Yeah, you would just be amazed. It is, you know, just. I mean, there's a reason when you bring up a call center, the person assumes you're an idiot, you know? Yeah. You know, if you've ever had that experience, you think, why oh, are you yeah. assuming that I'm an idiot? I'm not an idiot. <laughs> but you probably are, you know? <laughs> Statistically, you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so so that's a, a dilemma of democracy is that everyone should have a say, but not everyone is really qualified to have a say. So what's the answer to that? Yeah. You, it's just an old problem. You look at... Um, you look at Athens, where they finally gave the universal franchise. Originally, it was an aristocracy. It was originally it was a monarchy, then it was an aristocracy, mm. and then they had a kind of limited franchise. Things are going well, and then they gave everyone the vote, and they voted to have this um, idiotic invasion of Sicily, which destroyed them. Yeah. So you know, it was not long after they had the universal franchise. So it's an old problem, um, and uh, you know, uh, Cicero, the Roman writer um, and um, statesman, talked about this that 
you know, a, a monarchy turns into an aristocracy, uh, sorry, a dictatorship, t- tyranny turns into a monarchy because the tyrant wants his son, like in North Korea, to be the mm. king. And then that turns into an aristocracy because the, all the other heavies want to say. Mm. And then the aristocracy gradually becomes a democracy and then it collapses <laughs> because <laughs> people are not fit to rule. And then you end up with tyranny again. So, well, you know, it's like nothing's stable. No, no, no solution is stable. It's, uh, yeah, I, a friend of mine, uh, my husband, I don't know how much I agree with this, but he proposed that um, everyone is kind of categorized into a a place of expertise. So if you're a plumber, you get to vote on plumbing issues. And if, oh, you're, yeah. if you're a carpenter, carpenter issues, doctor, medical issues. And then you're only allowed to vote on the issues that you know about. You have to pass some tests or whatever to say that you know enough about this issue to vote, which is, um, I mean, maybe that's a solution. So that's, but that sort of runs into the same problem of um, representation because, you know, uh, say doctors would know a lot about medicine, but yeah. I have some qualifications around that, but yes, they know about medicine, but they would vote for things that are in their interests. Mm. So, for example, the AMA uh, years ago tried to make it so that you could not get multivitamins except on a prescription. Mm. So they mm. want all power for them. And, you know, so they would vote in their interests. So, yes, it's good that they would vote on their knowledge, but they would also vote in their interests. Yeah, also, would be mm. the interests of the community as a whole. And plumbers would, you know, hairdressers would sort of vote on a thing that says, well, to be a hairdresser, you either have to have been a hairdresser already, or you have to do a 15 year, you know, master's degree <laughs> in hairdressing or whatever. Yeah. Limit the supply. And I, I could imagine that, like, for instance, university teachers would be, would vote overwhelmingly left wing. And then you'd have this leftening of, uh, leftening of, of universities. Something like that. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think, um, you know, we have so many occupations now for which there is licensing and for which there's a really very little benefit, if mm-hmm. any. Um, I think one American state, they just removed um, two thirds of the occupational licensing. Thank um, God, some of it is ridiculous. Like, I mean, in Australia, you need a ladder license to, to work in a library and to use a ladder. It's like, you can't trust someone to use a ladder properly. You need a license for that. You need to do a two day course to tell someone not to fall off. Like, well, oh you know, man. I say, like, I retired about 11 years ago and I, and I thought, oh, like, maybe I'll go back and do some maths teaching or science teaching or something, you know, give back or whatever. Mm. You know? Yeah, but like the barriers that I had to overcome, like, you've got to do a two year master's degree, like, you get this huge hex debt, then you've got to do this and that and the other thing. It's like, I already know the stuff. Yeah. 90% of it will be a waste of time. Um, and and there's, there's no kind of balancing of the cost versus the benefit of the, these hurdles. Um, so eventually I decided, well, couldn't be bothered, you know. Um, and, you know, it could have been, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at doing a bit of tutoring, which is the, the barriers are much lower on, on, the, uh, uh, on that. But it's... Um, yeah, so, I mean, that's the thing that happens is that you get this phenomenon of regulatory capture. Mm. The, the government uh, brings in somebody to regulate a body and then the people that's trying to regulate take it over. Tim, I think you should do a podcast. I think that's how you should give back. <laughs> talk about all the stuff you're talking about now and just put it online. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, you know, I think regulatory capture is a big, uh, you know, really a, a cool concept. Once you heard about it, you see it everywhere. What is it? So it's the idea that if you, you, you set, the government sets up somebody to regulate someone because they're out of line. And within a pretty short period of time, the people that are supposed to be being regulated by this body own it and ah. control it. Like a classic is the um, Food and Drug Administration is basically owned by the um, agriculture lobby and the, um, and the pharmaceutical lobby and acts in their interests. You know, look at the recent approval of the um, um, the, the uh, medication for Alzheimer's disease, which mm-hmm. I'd be very surprised if it was at all all effective. Oh, okay. Uh, they approved that. And yet, they will not approve other things that are out of patent. Yeah. That um, you know, where pharmaceutical companies can't, you know, and they, like the, uh, the original um, dietary recommendations for a, you know, high carb diet. Mm. Uh, you know, they, the expert committee came up with a recommendation of three servings of carbohydrates a day, mm. and it went to the agriculture department and came back at eight. 
It's like the wheat guys said, that's not enough. It's nothing to do with health. So, um, you know, that's, a, that's a, and you see this all the time, uh, the regulatory capture, you know, the way the, um, uh, the financial regulators um, uh, look after Wall Street. Um, it, yeah, it's, um, it's, and you know, as I said, they've like the occupational licensing is a classic example where they bring in laws that make it harder. You know, um, when uh, my friend first became a psychologist, you just had to have an undergraduate degree. Mm. Now you have to have a master's at least. Uh, then it went to an honours degree, then you had to have a master's degree. And now they're talking about you having to have a PhD. Mm. Uh, so, you know, and, and what is the action? And when they do studies, they found that, you know, uh, people of the uh, reasonably intelligent people given a three day course, are just as effective yeah. in counselling yeah. as people who have a master's degree in psychology. Mm. So what's the benefit? The benefit is that it jacks up the fees. Well, I mean, it's it's such an overcrowded field that it's if everyone who wanted to be a psychologist became a psychologist, then we would just have too many and, and the price would drop and all sorts of terrible things. And so you just have to make it harder and harder to get into. I don't think all sorts of terrible things would happen. No, I think I, actually, I actually, actually like obviously, you know, you have standards around like if people abuse their position or whatever. Mm. But in general, um, what, you know, one terrible thing that happens is a lot of people can't afford the services of the psychologists. Yeah, yeah. Because, they, you know, it, it prices them out of the market or, um, you know, so this occupational licensing has a cost as well. Mm -hmm. And and as I said, there's just no benefit that someone with a master's is any better than someone with three days no. of training. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing as it may seem. I mean, I, I know a lot of people who have who have said like, oh, I went to a psychologist. I mean, I when I was a kid, I went to a psychologist and it didn't do it like it wasn't good. She wasn't good at her job and or at least for me, you know, yeah. and uh, but that not it wasn't just that it was like it took six weeks to get in and yeah. you know, for, a lot of money. for a depressed kid. It's like you don't really want to wait six weeks to get into a you know, and it was uh, psychologists are very hard to get into and, and they don't sometimes you need to go to like five different psychologists before you find the right one and yeah it's it's a complicated process yeah i, I mean i have had mixed uh, experiences um uh, i did go uh, at school i went to a psychologist who was completely useless mm. um it didn't help me at all uh but uh, after i left uni i went to a psych psychologist a psychiatrist who was very good you know in those days when Whitlam bought in Medicare you could go to a psychiatrist you know everything was free <laughs> you go to any specialist this bulk build you know oh. and uh, so I went to and he really he really did help me but um mm. yeah so I, I don't know but as I said there's really no evidence that all the extra training makes people more effective mm. uh, at the job and you know some people are terrible at the job when they've had lots of training mm. And you know and they're, they're not actually taken, tested on their efficient their effectiveness. They've taken eight years to find out as well. They didn't just do the job and say I'm not good at this and leave. They had to go through this rigorous training. For you it. Know, and a lot of training too is um, like they may have vast amounts of training, but in the wrong thing. Like yeah. the average doctor can't read a medical paper and understand the statistics. Yeah. So how are they actually updating their knowledge? You know they um, there's that. So um, it just it just doesn't um mm. it, you know often they have a very uh high degree of training but a lot of it often misses the point but if like a classic example is um I, you know i have an endocrinologist and uh endocrinologists to a, to a man and woman don't really think of the endocrine system as what it is a non-linear feedback system mm. they should be thinking about that should be in their head but they're all just looking at oh well you're in range you're out of range blah 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 very cookbook orientated approach they're not thinking about the system as a system mm. and it just seems that there's this culture in endocrinology in australia that they're all like this they've all been trained like this and if you came along and said look i think endocrinology has gone off the tracks in australia i'm going to open up shop as an endocrinologist and do better <laughs> you can't you'll get you get put in jail yeah it's, it's immune from repair mm. because they they pick each generation picks the next generation and of people just like themselves and they have exactly the same blind spots um, so, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of costs um, with the uh, occupational licensing, even at that level. Um, uh, yeah, so, I don't know. Um, 
it's tough. I mean, because if everyone just opened up shop as an endocrinologist, we would we would have the other pro the opposite problem with is which is unregulated markets. I mean, that means you know Tim's shop of endocrinology is amazing, but then Jeff's shop is terrible and he's killing people, and it's it's hard to figure out who's right and who's wrong. Yeah, I should probably give you Charles Murray's book why I'm a libertarian um, to read. Um, but you know the answer to that is that there will be quality control mechanisms. Hmm. But, they, but you know, so you will have organizations like choice or whatever or you know people will you know come up as intermediaries who will vet people and look at their quality and you'll be able to look at that but you know you might be able to make a trade-off and say look i don't really need an endocrinologist i just you know uh, my problem is very simple or whatever i don't need a very super high-powered person mm. my problem may be very simple and um and so you know maybe you can make a trade-off of quality and cost mm. a lot of people are just ruled can't go and see specialists because they just a can't get an appointment as you suggested, and uh, because the cost is prohibitive, mm. so, so it's it's not a, a straightforward thing. And you know, I, I would argue in many cases the government does not you know mandate provide better quality via the occupational licensing. It just limits the uh, supply. And in many cases the quality is worse because it's such a, a, a the supply is so limited they don't really have to compete on quality. Mm. And it's. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it, uh, I remember saying to my um, urologist about my cancer, that should I get a second opinion? He said, well, you can, but it'll be a guy just like me. <laughs> yeah, this is a monoculture and it's very true. Endocrinologists are the same and most specialties are the same. They have this sort of monoculture and they think it's best practice, but you know, maybe it isn't. Like the, the, the time that it takes the medical system to uh, assimilate new ideas Ideas is just appalling. Yeah. You know, going back to Semmelweis and the thing of washing hands, that took thirty years to mm. um, thirty years to um, to be accepted by the medical profession. He was handed out. He was handed out, hound, hounded out, and uh, his life was ruined. Do you need to get that? No, I'm just trying to kill it. it won't let me. <laughs> okay. I wonder what that is. Um. Oh no. It has risen again. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, what were we talking about? Uh, yeah. So, um, no, they, they, you get these uh, very limited monocultures and, uh, you know, if they're on the wrong track, mm. it can't, there's no self-correcting mechanism. But, you know, if you've got, say, like you look at, say, computers and you had all these mainframes, they were expensive, they were hard to mm. program, they had all these problems. And so you had many computers come along. Yeah. And, you know, if you had like a mainframe guild with it said, oh, we're not going to allow you in or whatever, would yeah. that have been your PCs? Yeah. You know, well, yeah, the, the computer industry is an interesting antithesis of academia. I mean, it's it's kind of nowadays with most computer programming jobs, it doesn't matter where your degree come from. It, it's like if you have a git, if you have a GitHub with a fantastic portfolio yeah. of, of working functioning projects and you have a high school diploma or no high school diploma, they'll still hire you. I mean, it's, it's just about what you can do. That's right. I mean, they're looking for it like you're smart and get things done. Yeah. That's what they want. Yeah. And, you know, anything else is, uh, is cream on the top. I mean, they, you know, in some some areas they might want, you know, a PhD in AI. Or yeah, something. for sure. Yeah. But there's some of those more researchy type things. Yeah. But yeah, that's, that's true. Um, but there are so many fields now where you just cannot do better. Mm. Now, you cannot get into the field by doing better. Mm. And, and, that, and that's, um, I think that, you know, that really slows down um, progress to, uh, to an extreme Right. It, it does. Know. Just like you were saying before, I have a friend who's a doctor who um, I was doing some intermittent fasting and she was yeah. like, oh, you're starving yourself and all this different stuff. And then I was yeah. like, no, look into it. It's intermittent fasting. Like I'm, I'm doing a 24 hour yeah. fast or whatever. Yeah. And then yeah. and she was like, oh, there's a nature article about how good intermittent fasting is. <laughs> then she started doing it. But yeah, but yeah. I mean, she like she just graduated a few years ago. No, she had no. I think she had maybe one or two lectures on nutrition, but exactly, yeah. I mean, it's most doctors don't have any knowledge of this stuff. Uh, that's right. And they're not really not equipped to assess the evidence either. I mean, because, you know, um, mm. you say, oh, there's an article in Nature, but a lot of article in Nature are, are, are flawed. Mm. You know, The Lancet is notorious for publishing shonky research. Mm. Oh, you know, yeah. Only one of the most famous medical journals in the world. Exactly. That, that That's um, that's good. Cool. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it's... um. You know, and you saw the example of where with the um, 
the history of this uh, theory that um, COVID may have come out of the Wuhan Institute of Virology, yeah. which is you know, 300 metres from the epicentre of the outbreak and just happened to be you know, doing research on this very virus. You know, total coincidence, of yeah, course. It's strange. And uh, yeah. so part of the thing was like they left basically said, well, look, Trump advanced this theory, therefore it must be true, false. It's racist. Not only is it false, it's, it's racist. racist as and well. you can't it believe be it because it's racist. But now, you know, um, Joe Biden has sprinkled holy water on the idea. Oh, good. Uh, apparently it's all, that's acceptable. So, she, you know, and Facebook has stopped banning people who post about it. Um, yeah. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the sort of medical establishment that got behind the scenes and like published this article and they basically, the people who actually organised it, who had the conflict of interest of funding the Wuhan lab, mm. left their names off the letter because they didn't want people to realise what was going on. Mm. They were trying to cover themselves because they've been funding this research, you know, albeit indirectly. Um, you know, so all this sort of shonky stuff. I remember um, uh, I said to my uh, professor, um, my urologist, um, you know, there was some study I was quite interested in. And I said, do you think if I emailed this guy and asked him for the data, he would give me the data so mm -hmm. I could do a sort of slightly different analysis? They don't, they don't do that. And he said, Oh no, there'd be all sorts of shonky stuff going on with the covers they would not get to know about. Don't even think about it. I mean, even if I asked for it as a professor, forget it. Yeah. So all sorts of all sorts of shonky and you know, particularly um there was a meta analysis which done which showed that basically if a pharmaceutical company funded a piece of research on a drug that they sold, it's four times more likely to produce a positive outcome than if it was funded independently. So you know, these are <laughs> These huge biases, um, which often, you know, they people are blissfully unaware of. Um, you know, my, um, you know, wife's GP was trying to persuade her to go on statins, and um, I pointed out to her that, like, after two thousand three, they changed the rules to make it much harder to rig studies. Mm. You know, you had, to, you know, after two thousand three, if a study studied after two thousand three, you had to pre-specify the study design. You had to pre-specify the statistical analysis, how it would all be done, what the endpoints were that you would assess, etc. And since then, the statin studies have been a big, big fat nothing. Oh wow! They reduce. They have huh. produced a reduction in LDL cholesterol. That's true. Yeah. It does reduce LDL cholesterol because your body doesn't make LDL cholesterol particles in order to kill you. Yeah. It makes it for a reason. <laughs> so it's not necessarily given that reducing LDL is a, is a good thing. Um, and since then, there's been virtually nothing. And I said to the GP, look, you give us a study that shows the statins are a benefit that was started after 2003 under the new rules. And she couldn't, she came up with three studies that were all before that. Huh. So, um, you know, you've, and you've got, um, one of them was quite funny because they said, um, uh, um, it was a study of heart attack, people that had a heart attack or something like a stroke or something, and they gave them statins. And they have showed a relationship between non-HDL cholesterol and heart attack risk. Mm -hmm. and, and I like, why didn't they just do a study on LDL cholesterol and heart attack risk? And it turns out they did analyze it, but it's not statistically significant. Oh. So they needed the goalpost and they're like, they, what can we find that's statistically significant? This is what they do, right? So they might have 30, a choice, or they, there's one study where they said, oh, what will, uh, they reported, taking statins reduces the risk of bypass surgery. Mm -hmm. Now it's interesting, why didn't they report on, you know, the number of deaths? Why didn't they report on the number of heart attacks? Hmm. Why didn't they, you know, all these other things, they just found the one thing. Just because bypass surgery. Doing bypass surgery is a very uh, elective thing. Yeah. It's very much subject to the opinion of the doctor and you know uh, you also uh, can't do it if you're dead but yeah yeah so well they take they take into account the okay. uh, nutrition rate or whatever um yeah so so um the, the um typically uh, uh the the studies will not report deaths mm. so you take a drug what you would hope is you, you are less likely to die right that was a key indicator, but they often don't report that. They report like, they might report a reduction in heart attacks or mm. reduction in bypass surgery or something. But what they don't report is, you know, maybe you've got people who take statins are more prone to get pneumonia, for example. Mm. They don't report those 
things that look my, bad. Uh, my aunt took statins and she got I think she got overweight and I think it was she she got pretty obese and I think part of it was because of the statins I yes, don't know it's making more prone to get uh, diabetes oh good uh, yeah. I, I think and um, so there's that but also statins uh, interfere with the energy production by mm -hmm. uh, impeding the production of coenzyme Q10 Mm. So often people do feel very uh, tired and when you're tired you tend to eat to compensate mm. um, uh, so there's there's that and you know um, LDL cl uh, cholesterol particles are very uh, integral to the immune system so this uh, probably explains why uh, when you take statins you become more prone to certain infections and so on mm. um, uh, but you know the, the, the GP was just uh, is just you know she said oh I'm a dunce with statistics. I hate it. And I was like, how can you be a doctor and keep up? And of course, you know how they keep up. I'll tell you a funny thing uh, happened to me coming home from one of the less strong meetings. Uh, I got a lift with uh, this lady who did medical training, the nurses and so forth. And she thought, oh, I could give this course that she'd worked out for two GPs. So she contacted a local GP society and said, oh, I have this course. I'm wondering if, you know, there would be some interesting people doing the course and you know blah blah after hours whatever and they've been talking for a while and the, and the and the guy said um hold on a minute do you charge for this I said, well yes you know like i need to earn a living sort of thing it's like oh we get all their training from the pharmaceutical companies and they don't charge us a cent wow and apparently i've checked this out and this is actually true right so you can imagine what they're being told so that's how they get their you know training and they do their you know, training hours, right? You go along for a nice de deal, you have an entertaining speaker, and then you have a few slides about how statins are fantastic or whatever the drug du jour is. Yeah. And you get your, you know, you get your uh, credits for your training hours and everyone's happy. Wow. And of course, if you don't toe the line on prescriptions, guess what happens? What? You don't get invited to the next free training session. <laughs> So everyone understands how the system works. And they're not just free training sessions either, they're networking too. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And so, yeah, yeah friends and, there. And, and, and so, um, it's, uh, it's, you know, this, they say there's no such thing as a free lunch. Uh, so the pharmaceuticals don't do this, companies don't do this because they're great guys. They do <laughs> make money out of it, you know. And they do, they, they create these incentives at all levels of the hierarchy, you know, right up to the, the most influential professors or whatever. They get speaking engagements, the very high fees, the, um, consulting, da, da, da. So, and again, it's all, everyone understands how it works. You know, it's yeah. conditional on, um, mm. on, um, on, on telling that line. So this is, you know, um, you know, it's not like there's any one bad person in the system. Like the GPs are like thinking, well, will I pay $5,000 for some training or will I go onto this thing? The training, you know, um, you know, they've got incentives, you know, they're trying to make a living. They're trying mm. to pay off their debt for, med for medical education. You know, the pharmaceutical companies, the guys are trying to sell stuff. They're trying to make a living, look after, it. you know, no one's really trying to be evil, mm. but it just sort of, the system kind of um, creates these sort of perverse, uh, perverse um, outcomes. Uh, you know, this is how you get regulatory capture that, you know, you get the same thing with the people on the committees that decide what drugs get through or whatever. You know, you often find they have conflicts of interest in terms of consulting to these companies, etc. Mm. So, so um, you know, that you don't like with people who are that smart, you don't have to make sort of blunt threats. It's yeah. the same with politics where, you know, a lot of ex-politicians are employed by various companies that were in industries that they were the minister of. Yeah. And uh, there's some, some notorious examples of people being given, you know, made up jobs at high salaries. That's what they do in the military too, right? Military guys, uh, generals leave the military and then join General Dynamics. Dar DARPA, or, yeah. yeah, General Dynamics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so, um, and again, everyone, no one's really trying to be evil, but, mm. uh, you know, and you could make an argument that maybe you do want some ex military people in to add some house or whatever, but, you know. The, I, think the, the, I think the point was that they were being, um, they were being contracted into like missile companies as kind of, with these huge bonuses and kind of made up jobs and things like that. Yeah, and in, in Japan, they call it, you know, descent from heaven. It's a similar, the same concept where basically the bureaucrats get rewarded for, for looking after the people that they um, they are su supposed to be uh, regulating. Mm. Um, so, uh, 
Uh, but, you know, again, I think Deming's idea that it's really your best to look at how the system is structured and how the system works mm. deal with the system. Um, That's you know, a very good a, point. Yeah. There's, there's this sort of um, essay about like levels of intervention in a system and decrying the, you know, the, the sort of poor moral standards of the people in the system is really a very low level intervention. You know, and you know, through right, the highest level is like, what is the thinking that underlies the system? Mm. Uh, you know, it's probably the high, you know, changing the thinking around it. You know, it was a bit like sort of what Nelson Mandela did, was successful with for a while with South Africa. Mm. Uh, the, the thinking was that we're in this race war and we hate them and they hate us. And, you know, and he um, he did a lot to try and bring people together, at least for yeah, a time. Forgiveness and, uh, yeah, forgiveness and compassion. And overcome it. So, you know, just a different kind of uh, thinking, whereas a lot of the people in this government were very much in this sort of vengeance mode. Now we're in charge, we get all the goodies kind of. Mm. Um, Even on a simpler level, like I go to I go to a restaurant um, quite often and there's every single, I won't name names, but every single time we go there, they fuck up our order without a, without fail. I don't think they've ever once, had, we've had a whole meal where they've gotten something right. All right. And, and the person, it's, it's, it's entertaining. It's like really fun to go there and be like, what are they going to fuck up? Um, but somebody with us said, oh, uh, they're pretty stupid here, aren't they? And I was like, well, it's it's not that they're stupid. It's that there's, and it, like, because different people keep fucking this up over and over yeah. again. So it's not like all the staff members are stupid. They're they're just, they, they have a system that's terrible inherently. Like, I, I kind of just want to go in there and be like, how is your system so bad? Like, fix yes. this shit. Yeah. And I mean, that's kind of how it is at a government level, I guess, is what you're saying. Yes, that's right. So, you know, just berating the waiter for yeah. getting the order wrong is not this going to fix the problem. Mm. You know, it's just, you saw this most, um, it came up when like air safety, you know, um, where basically saying, you know, putting something down to pilot error doesn't mm. solve the problem. Mm. I was like, well, how did the pilot error happen? Was it yeah. training? Were they too distracted? Did they have too much to do? Did they not have a checklist? Mm. You know, whatever it is, you know, and then you're starting to actually deal with the, um, uh, with the, uh, the actual fundamental issue and you have a chance of actually fixing it a but system it, should account for human error that's part of a system I mean, well you know and, and like um actually i met there's this guy aeronautical engineer called murphy who came up with this you know whatever can go wrong will go wrong and he was actually making a serious point you know if you have a system where something can go wrong then eventually that thing will happen yeah you have to actually build a system where nothing can go wrong yeah and and, and that's um that, that was so that's really what they try to do is just like make air transport so so such that nothing can actually go wrong mm. you know everything there's so many degrees of safety and checks and da 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 yeah if you look at aircraft investigations it's like oh all the electricity out and then we had a fire and then the pilot wanted to kill himself it's like three you know yeah like it, it has to be like giant flaws and then multiple giant flaws stacked together to cause an aircraft to 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 crash and i actually heard this um i, I read this transcript of this um korean uh flight that flew into a mountain mm -hmm. and the pilot was flying into this mountain and the the deputy could see this but in korean society of being very hierarchical oh my god he wouldn't challenge his boss oh my god so he would say things he's oh, it was just excruciating to work uh, he would say things like, radar can be very useful. And uh, but none of it worked. And, they, you know, then there's this... You know. Speaking like Confucius the whole time, like radar he, can he's be He's trying useful. to sort of hint to the pilot, look at the radar, you dummy, rather without saying, look at the radar, you dummy. Right? And so, but then the response to that is not saying, oh, he should have been... They actually tra retrained all their air crews to be more like Americans. Yeah and you know to speak up hmm. and you know because that was the level at which the problem you know you have to solve a problem at the level at which it um it occurs which is a problem at a level of culture that you don't challenge authority mm. and and you know if you know something and the person in authority doesn't you need to um, convey that to them hmm. wow so, so that's um but i sort of just get um i'm very interested in this question of how can you make a democracy work and how do you deal with that issue mm. of that we were talking about before of that you want everyone to have be enfranchised but you want the smart informed view to also provide smart informed and wise i i yeah. would say i know a lot of smart people who are not wise so that's another yeah. problem i know some dumb people who are wise as well so i, I wouldn't necessarily want to take away 
every person with a, a low IQ's vote away. Well, because and they have interests as well. So it's it's really a conflict between knowledge and interest. But you make another point that there is a sort of deeper wisdom, not just technocratic wisdom, mm. knowledge, but, you know, a deeper, you know, ability to sort of step back and look at things and, you know, what's, you know, there's all issues like, you know, what are the longer term effects of doing this? You know, it's like the classic thing is like some of the Democrats in America are saying, oh, we're going to have a one-off wealth tax. Mm. We'll confiscate X percent of people's wealth once. Uh, you know, well, of course, no one believes it's only going to happen once. No. Why would it only happen once? Mm. And because so then, but then, you know, that will then create all sorts of downstream effects. People are thinking, well, like, do I actually want to start my business in America? No. They're going to do this? And they're not. People are leaving America in droves. Like corporations, finance companies that don't need, like, they're just leaving. They're go cause they're going to Ireland. They're doing everything online. Yeah. It, it just... And you say, you say, um, in, um, uh, that the, you know, California last year had a population loss. Mm -hmm. you know, so many companies, you know, Tesla, a lot of companies are leaving California. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they, for the first time ever, they've had a net population drain relative to the. To yes, the, it's no surprise. It's, this has been building up for years. It, it's a sort of funny thing, though, that you get the people who voted in the people who created the havoc in California, and then they move to another state, and then they vote for the same kind of people in the other state <laughs> and turn them into California. And uh, so, I don't know. Uh, you see this, um, you see this a lot. Mm. Uh, so I suppose that's you've really picked my brain about uh, renewables. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, it would it'd be interesting to talk to some politicians and just see um, uh, what they're thinking. I would love to. Is I mean, a lot of them are just all about being elected. And yeah. All, you know. Um, they're humans too. They have their own. Don't go beyond that. But, you know, there are, and that's the ones that I really admire who can play both games mm. and get elected and they can actually do the good things in, in the longer term things. Mm -hmm. uh, but that requires another, you know, tier of ability. Yeah. You know, in terms of like CEOs, you talk about the Nobby Clarks or the Don Arguses of this world. Mm. And, and they're pretty, um, you know, and I think Bob Hart Hawk could do that sort of thing. Yeah. Or Keating. You know, Keating could sort of create a narrative. You know, he would see a problem and then he would create a narrative around it, like the, the fact that, you know, you wouldn't remember maybe, but, you know, he came to the view that, like, Australia had this moribund, uncompetitive economy. Mm. We needed to have, you know, um, you know deregulation and liberalisation. Oh, yeah. interesting. Now, now, you might, you could argue about, the, you know, what the benefits were, but, you know, it was terrible. We had enormously high, you know, 66% tariffs on textiles, clothing and footwear. Wow. So like buying a pair of shoes was like a big purchase, you know, kind of thing. It was a big thing. Now you buy a pair of shoes without really thinking about it. Right? Yeah. Uh, but you know, in those days, they were just enormously. Um, so you know, and there were tariffs on all sorts. You know, and, and you know, import quotas and restrictions. And, uh, you know, it was it was really terrible. And so, but he created a sense of urgency around the problem. And and people thought he was. It's funny because like people overseas thought he was an idiot because he got on the radio and he said something like you know you do this thing you do this thing and before you know it you're a banana republic and that word you know just resonated he just created that he was able to sort of create the narrative you know trump could do the same thing yeah in the in the sense that in a different way but he could create a get people thinking about a thing uh you know but that but i don't see that in our current um i, I don't really see anyone in the leadership of either side it's not like you say, well, you get rid of Scott Morrison. Who would you put in place? Yeah. In place? You know, um, or, you know, on the ALP side, no one really leaps out at me as, as a, you know, person of sort of tremendous ability. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's, but that's something we need to do is, you know, try and encourage good people to get into politics. But, you know, maybe politics is doing too much. Maybe we're asking too much of the government. You know, when you look at, like, say, <clears throat> when I left school, the government was just far smaller and tried yeah. to do far far less and you know they struggled, struggled, struggled to do a lot of that but there's, now, this, there's this problem with the government where it's uh they they don't have a, i think i think one of the main problems is that they don't have a focus on efficiency they don't need to because they can always get more money a company can't just magically take more money out of the system so i have a friend who works for the public transport industry in, uh in victoria and she said that they 
they're I don't know they're building a new railroad or something. But she said that every every employee who ever possibly might go off site gets a new iPhone. So in this one department, it's like 500 people. So that's five hundred thousand dollars just blown into yeah. the wind. You yeah. I mean it's because some regulation where you can't put apps on your employees' phones or something. But like you could probably pay every employee five hundred dollars to for the right to put an app on their phone, and they'd probably say yes, and you would half the cost immediately yeah. you know anything like that i mean there's they um they had a meeting off site and then they paid every employee a taxi voucher like there's just all this stuff that they just do not she she says like her job in her job she she just doesn't have enough work she works like one or two hours a day and then she learns japanese the rest and paints the rest of the time <laughs> like yeah. and, I, and it's not just the direct costs that they're insensitive to but the costs they impose on people yeah uh, which are often you know just incredible and there's just no sensitivity um uh, you know or then there's no there's no incentive to provide good service um you know i'm trying to apply for a commonwealth seniors health care card at the moment it's just a nightmarish experience yeah. But you have no choice. You've just got to deal with their broken, totally broken process because they don't have any incentive to, um, to improve. It was interesting. I was, there was a story on the ABC today where uh, the New South Wales government has brought in a thing where they've stopped warning people about speed cameras. Mm, so know. all the speed cameras are now secret. Yeah. And <clears throat> the amount of speed, if tough traffic infringements under 10 kilometres an hour over the limit has gone up 16 fold. Mm hmm since this time. And of course, you know, under 10 kilometers over the limit, it really, it's, it's not much of a risk. Mm. You know, in fact, if you sit on the limit, you'll people, someone will be two inches behind you flashing their headlights, you know. It's, and not to mention, if you're speeding and you see a speed camera sign, and it's around a dangerous corner, you're going to slow down, yeah. and you're going to take that corner slowly, which is going to be safer for everyone. That's why you put them on dangerous yeah. corners. And yeah. Then when you remove that, you just got guys recklessly. Speeding. I do is not to have more people speed and catch them and make more running. But then yeah. if fact, is in fact the, um, the, uh, the is in fact the objective. And you know, there's some economists in the US did a study and they found that traffic enforcement was basically optimised to revenue, mm. not to safety. Of course, yeah. So, um, so uh, you know, of course, that, that's the, you know, the incentives that the um, government has. Just one more thing, like. I was talking to a, a neighbor who's who's getting DA approval, but actually everyone I know, DA approval is um, approval if you like renovate your house and yeah. you need to ask the council for permission to renovate or, you know. Yeah. So every single person I know who's gotten DA approval, it has been an, a long and arduous process. It has taken a year, six, three yeah. years. I mean, it's a, it's a terrible process and they just reject you for all these unknown reasons and they, they kind of pick and choose. If you, if you had a, had a company, and every single person unanimously yeah. who used this company was like, they take way too long and everything, they, they do it badly and everyone unanimously has a bad time with them. They would just get outcompeted immediately. Like they would not last as a company, but because of the government and they have a monopoly on giving out yeah. uh, council permission, they can just do whatever the hell they want, waste everyone's time, waste everyone's money. Well, and uh, actually my brother was talking about this because he's doing an uh, extension on a house he bought. And uh, the Blue Mountain City Council has a thousand pages of building regulations. Oh my God. And of course, you cannot actually comply with them all. No. Like, it's actually impossible. And so it just means that they have total um, ability to subject, you know, reject your application on subjective grounds. Yeah. And the guy two doors down was doing an extension. And they knocked him back on these absolutely, totally petty fogging things. And, and he couldn't work it out. And he said eventually he worked out that they didn't like the style that he was building the house in. Oh, and so, you know, therefore, but because there's so many rules, they can just reject you basically based on their opinion mm. um, because they just have so many ways to knock you back. Mm. And so he changed the style and then it went through. Um, oh, my God. But, but because there's no law that says you can't build a sort of California bungalow house or whatever it is in the Blue Mountains. Yeah. But but he eventually had to kind of work it out for himself. <laughs> But you know, they, because there's so many laws that they have the ability to uh, to just apply their uh, subjective um, uh, preferences mm. uh, to to your case. All right, I yeah. think this is uh, probably a good time to conclude yep. the podcast. Hey, okay. thank you All so right. much for coming on. I had okay, a really good time. Good luck editing it. 